Continue. So it looks like we're live. I believe that you are, yes. And you are recording, Steve. So we're good to go. The appointed hour of 6.02 having been reached, I welcome everyone to this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals. My name is Steve Judge, I'm chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals. I hereby call this meeting to order. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended again by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Additionally, the meeting's recordings have made may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and the ZBA webpage. Please indicate that you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when the public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate that you wish to make the comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the Zoning Board of Appeals Chair. If a speaker does not comply with the guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be discon disconnected from the meeting. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts chapters, uh, Chapter 40A and Article 10 Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties of interest. We'll begin with the roll call of the regular members of the ZBA. Uh, Steve Judge is here. Mr. Meadows? Present. Mr. Henry? Here. Mr. White? Present. Mr. Sloviter? Here. Also in attendance tonight is uh, Ms. Pam Field, Sadler, uh, Planning Assistant and Program Assistant with Amherst, and Christine Brestrup, the Planning Director. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting its health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw is Section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and recorded by town staff. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or to seek additional information. After the, board, after the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, present your name and address to the board for the record all questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing for the variance to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20 day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with a relevant judicial body in superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded. That's registry of deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda. Um, first is approval of the minutes from April, uh, consideration of approval of the minutes from April 25th, 2024. Public hearings on ZBA FY 2024-17, Jonathan Clay, request for a special permit under section 6.3 and 5.10 with the zoning bylaw to, get, to create a flag lot and to construct construct a single family house on the premises. At 47 Redgate Lane, map 11D, parcel 166 RN, neighborhood residence zoning district. This is continued from May 9th, 2024. ZBA FY 2024-18, Mathena Morrissey, requ 
request for a special permit under section 3.3211 of the zoning bylaw to convert a single family dwelling into a non-owner occupied duplex with a requested waiver from the sign plan at 180 North Whitney Street, map 11D, parcel 261, RG, general residence zoning district. This is also continued from May 9th, 2024. ZBA FY 2024-20, Ron Verdier requests for a special permit under section 3.325 and 3.231 of the zoning bylaw to construct a 5,712 square foot mixed use building with nine residential units and two first floor commercial spaces and to construct a raised walkway in the FPC the flood prone conservation zoning district with a requested waiver from the traffic impact study at 395 West Street, map 19D, parcel one, RVC, village center residence, and FPC, flood prone conservancy zoning districts. We'll have a public meeting at the conclusion of the public hearing on all three items and discussion. Following there's general public comment on any matter not before the board tonight, and then other business not anticipated within the past 48 hours. The first order of business tonight is approval of the minutes from April 25th, 2024. Has everyone on the board had a chance to review the previous meeting's minutes? And are there any edits or concerns that members have? I've reviewed them. I found them um, accurate and, and fulsome. Um, and if there's no comments or no concerns, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes from um, get it right here. Minutes from April 25th, 2024. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. It's moved and seconded. Any discussion on the motion to approve the minutes? If not, the vote occurs on the motion to approve the minutes from April 25th, 2024. The chair votes aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Motion carries, the minutes are approved. Um, as we proceed through these um, three, three special permit applications, I've under, I understand that the third, the one from Mr. Laverdier on um, West Street, is he is requesting that we uh, postpone con or continue consideration of this to a later date. My understanding from Ms. Brestrup is that they, are, they determined they needed a, a waiver or at least further, not a waiver, but further a special permit for a fill that was not um, um, determined when we had our site visit. So instead of taking it bit by bit, he'd rather have the whole um, special permit issue heard at one meeting. And I think he's going to request that. Is that correct, Ms. Brestbrook? Yes, um, he's not attending the meeting tonight, but he did submit a an email, which I forwarded to all of you. And um, so he is requesting a continuation of his public hearing. I think you need to open it first and then yeah. continue it. So are you going to do that later? I'll you... do that later. Yeah, but I just wanted to kind of lay the, the groundwork for the, the board that we really have two full hearings that, that we'll deal with today. Mm -hmm. um, the, 2024-17 and 2024-18. May I mention something as long as yeah. I have the floor? This is regarding the uh, project on um, Redgate Lane. I think I neglected to include the old special permit from 2019 in the packet. And so I've just sent um, to Pam and to Mr. Judge um, the uh, decision, the 2019 um is it 2019 I think. So if we need to refer to that with regard to conditions, we can do that. And I apologize for not having that, uh, sent you that in your packets. I think that some of that special permit may have been included in some of the comments, but it's good to have the official version from the town. Thank you, Ms. Brushbo. Yes, because I, I don't have it, Chris. I didn't get it. So Steve, yeah. if we need it, We'll either have to go into that comment packet or you will need to bring it up because it's not in my email. It's not in your email? No. I just sent it. Um, in, uh... Yep, I got it at 524. Here's it. No, that's a, 
That's different. You can try. Here we go, Chris. We've got it. I, I have it. Okay. Good. Six oh eight. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes, and it just came in mind too. So. Okay, good. So if we need to refer to it, we can. And I apologize again for not having included it. No problem. All right. Um, so the first order of business is a public hearing on ZBA 2024-17, Jonathan Clayt, request for a special permit under section 6.3 and 5.10 of the zoning bylaw to create a flag lot and to construct a single family house on the premises at 47 Redgate Lane, map 11D, parcels 166RN, neighborhood residence zoning district. Um, so we, two things, we, number one, we had a site oh, no visit. Color. We had a site visit on Tuesday. Um, myself, Mr. Sloviter, and Mr. Henry all attended. We walked, we met with the, the applicant and his, uh, and the engineer, um, Mr. Sparkle. We, um, we heard a description of what the, what the goal of the uh, applicant is to create the flag lot. We walked along the driveway of the, the proposed driveway uh, to the flag lot. We walked back through the, along that driveway to the, the uh, likely placement of the house. We observed where the um, pro forma uh, house was set up. It's not a, the actual, it's not a specific building um, proposed for this, but a, a, a demonstration building. Uh, demonstration residents at that spot. We observed the contours of the land um, and Mr. Uh, Clay talked about the uh, past applications that have been approved for the flag, flag lot in the past. Um, we observed the, the drainage and the, where the drainage would entail at the end of the downslope at the end of the property and we looked over to the conservation land on the other side of the property line. That's pretty much what we did, I think, in that, uh, and then we left. Um, Mr. Sloviter or Mr. Henry, is there anything you wish to add to the site visit? I think, you covered it. I think you covered it, Mr. Judge. Yes, I have, nothing, I have nothing to add. So what I'd like to do now is to go over the submissions, public submissions from the town, as well as submissions from the, from the public or public comments. And I just have to pull up the um, project application report. So submissions include the following, um, ZBA app 2024-17, an application form, a management plan and a project, as well as a project summary. Uh, plans prepared by Bucky Sparkle PE, the engineer dated 3-21-2024, which included title sheet, existing conditions, proposed conditions, um, and details. A swept path, a truck turning analysis, a stormwater summary, and an earthworks estimation. There were no um, additional staff submissions that I, I am aware of. We also have two public comments that we've received uh, via email. The first is from an abutting landowner. Hold on. The first is from uh, Mr. Kurt Wise and Rachel Brody, owners of 63 Redgate Lane, dated May 20th, 24, which includes not only this letter to the ZBA, but also previous letters to the ZBA in 2016, and I think in 2018, uh, regarding flag lot applications. We received, recently we received a, uh, from May, on May 20th, we received a a letter from an email from Yale Fürst and Jennifer Mack. And we received a letter um, today from Jennifer Bajorek and Stuart Naifa, or Naife. I'm sorry, I, I think I mispronounced your name. I apologize. Um, and that also includes previous letters to other um, special permit applications for a flag lot on this property. I think that's all the public comment that we've received so far. Is that right, Pam and Chris? To the best of my knowledge, yes. Yep. So um, at this point, I'd like to uh, ask the petitioner um, who's going to present for the petitioner, introduce themselves and give their name and address for the record. 
And Pam, if we can bring them in to the, mm -hmm. as a panelist, that would be good. So I think I see Mr. Sparkle is on the attending list. And I see Mr. Clayt is also on the attendee list. Did any of them come over? There's Bucky right there. Yeah. Note to panelists. Jonathan Clayt. Mr. Clayt. Okay, there we go. All right, Mr. Clay, you're the petitioner who's uh, who's representing. First, identify yourself, and then who's representing you tonight. Oh, you're you're muted. Good evening. I'm Jonathan Clay, um, 47 Redgate Lane. I am the property owner and the petitioner. I'm being represented by Bucky Sparkle, the engineer. And Mr. Is Mr. Spielvogel? Um, yeah. Consultants. I beg pardon. Was that a question to me? Yeah, there was. Did you have any other consultants? There was another person who was uh, brought into the meeting. But they're no. gone now. So okay. No, no, no other consultants. All right. Okay. And Mr. Sparkle, are you doing the presentation? Yes, I am. I am. Thank you, Mr. Judge. Um, my name is Becky Sparkle. I'm the engineer, and I'm going to be running through uh, a short um, uh, little slide presentation here that covers the high points of the application. Share my screen. And uh, <clears throat> go through. All right. Um, let me just verify that uh, the flag lot uh, presentation okay, Mr. Sparkle, is. Okay, I, I failed to do one thing before I started this. Just brief, hold on for just a second. Of course. I when I intended to start this, I noted we had two, we had two applications before us, both of which I think will take some time. It's I think the best way to deal with this is to provide an hour and a half for each of these two um, presentations. If we're done at that time, we're done. If not, we'll continue them. Uh, but I want to give make sure I give the ability for public comment on both, and I want to try to get to both. So. Um, We'll, we'll try it. We'll go until about 730. We'll take a break, then we'll move on to the next matter. And if we completed it by that time, that's great. If not, we'll, we'll continue it at another point. So I just want to make sure that the board knows how we're proceeding tonight before we go any further. There we go. All right, Mr. Sparkle, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but yep. you take care of that ministerial business. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, if I've done my job well, it won't be a 90 minute presentation, uh, but you know, we're gonna we're gonna go through it. So uh, I guess I need to slide things around. Um, as uh, indicated before, uh, the applicant and owner is Jonathan Clayt, um, living at 47 Redgate Lane, and I uh, am Bucky Sparkle, taking care of the application and presentation this evening. Um, I want to go over um, a couple of points about the application um, because this is a flag lot. Um, we do need a special permit, of course, per bylaw 6.3. And um, un unlike the third item on the agenda, we, we are aware of bylaw 5.10 regarding filling of land, uh, which uh, has a couple different triggers um, in order to create a, a relatively level backyard for the plan, which I'll be bringing up in a moment. Um, on a s sloped site, we do end up filling one small area um, about six and a half feet. However, the overall, the average net fill on the disturbed area is about seven inches, about 6.6 6 feet. Um, and also as indicated, this is an application to create a flag lot. It is to be sold. So it is a demonstration house, a demonstration driveway, a demonstration grading plan, all of which are hopefully adequately generous that the next person who comes along, who applies for a building per permit under this special permit, will find that they'll be able to build a, a reasonably sized home and, and have a reasonable yard without needing to you know, return to the ZBA to either amend or come for a new special permit. Uh, and as was indicated, 
Uh, yes, uh, special permit 2019-07 uh, was the last uh, flag lot permit application that was approved. I ran that application. Prior to that, application 2016-025 for the flag lot was approved and I ran that application. So this is my third time for this exact same ZBA application. Uh, and prior to my involvement back in 2005 is when the flag lot was created. Um, it was at that time that Mr. Clay purchased the property to um, you know, manage, manage the land as best he could. Um, but it's been about two decades and it's time for Mr. Clay to let that go. Now we're gonna look at uh, the area and quick overview. Uh, on the image, we have all the black heavy outline is Mr. Clayt's property at 47 Redgate Lane. The solid black line, this is the proposed uh, flag lot. And the dash black line is the frontage lot, the remainder. Um, this site is fully wooded, at least in the flag lot area. Uh, it slopes from west to east, so it's high at Redgate Lane, low as you go back. And it is uh, connected to town water and sewer. We also get a sense of the density of the neighborhood with some of these other structures around uh, in addition to uh, that there is at least one building that is is even farther off the main road than uh, the proposed project. Looking a little more detail at the existing conditions site, um, in this case, Redgate Lane is at the bottom of the page and to the north is to the left. Um, if you want to orient and I'm going to zoom in just a little bit so we get a little bit better detail over some of this. And um, starting off at the access strip, uh, we, all, all of the large trees on the property have been located. And you can see a sort of a dash divided green olive color line that indicates the limit of fill. Uh, we'll get into the grading plan and the layout plan soon just familiarizing hopefully uh, the board and members of the public with the property. Um, the, the site is fully wooded um, and, and you'll see you know where the contours do lie, but um, a, a decent amount of clearing will be happening in order to construct the proposed residence. We also do have one location of a soil test hole that was done to help us determine what the most appropriate stormwater management configuration would be. And now to look at the, the site itself, uh, I'm gonna similarly zoom in to the access strip first, where um, we have town water and sewer. So the utilities, you know, red being electric, green would be the sanitary line, which will be a pumped system um, because it is, uh, the site is much lower than the road. Uh, the municipal sewer is in that deep. So we will be needing to pump up to it. Um, and we have also the uh, water line that comes in. We have the first 50 feet of the driveway at 5% slope, and then we make it um, at 10% grade, which is really about as, as steep as we can get. Um, and moving into the site itself. Uh, once we get to the open building area of the lot, uh, the driveway grade uh, levels out, so there's a level parking area that has access to a proposed garage. Now, this is a sample house footprint. The, the darker area is 2,800 square feet, so it's, it's, a, it's a fairly large size, um, just indicated you know, for you know, some demonstration purposes. And um, in, in this case, it does have amenities like decks and a porch that are fairly common to, to most residential construction. We do propose um, a, uh, maybe a 40 by 60 backyard, relatively level area. And because it's um, all on a slope and we have to level off for the driveway in the backyard, there's a decent amount of fill required. This is the area where we exceed five feet of fill in a 2000 square foot area. And you'll see a little more detail of that at the on the last slide. And at the far side, the east side of the property, we have the stormwater management area, which is um, you know, normally not required for an A&R lot, but this is a flag lot and the special permits do require some consideration for stormwater management. So the way this system works is 100% of the new impervious area of the driveway in the house ends up um, in this basin. There's a swale that runs along the back lot line that helps drag 
will capture water and, and send it northward into the basin. It's about a thousand square foot footprint. It has a volume of about 870 some cubic feet. It is an infiltration system, which means that um, as water comes in, it actually does have the opportunity to soak into the ground. So um, for the larger storm events that this can manage, it will actually infiltrate um, over 1500 cubic feet of water into the ground, which means that this site is actually going to discharge uh, far less water in the developed condition with this stormwater management than the current undeveloped condition because there's nothing to slow the water down. Uh, other features that are important and which have been, you know, au just automatically added in because this is not the first go around for this application. We've, we've definitely heard from uh, the neighbors um, in the past, of course, you know, time changes, neighbors change, opinions change. I'm very well interested in hearing the perspectives. Um, I haven't received any of those public comments myself, or at least not been able to review them. Um, but we have added screening. So um, these green areas are strategically located buffers between the existing homes, say at 63 and 75 Redgate and uh, over at 68 Maplewood. So these are a minimum 10 foot tall uh, evergreen, so year round vegetated buffer. Um, on the west and I guess on the north and west side of the proposed structure and similarly isolating from 47 Redgate uh, is another 10 foot tall uh, vegetative buffer that is going to make this uh, structure uh, far, far less impactful on the abutters. And then uh, one of the things that came out of the last time we w went around was uh, that um, the uh, residents here uh, were not very excited about, you know, a new driveway going down, you know, off the edge of their property. So as uh, from their house screening, this is a, a six foot tall wall, which is generally adequate to handle most vehicular vehicles uh, so that we're not, um, you know, bringing the additional sort of glare and lights up and down a driveway, um, which, you know, of course, uh, the current condition doesn't have, but when there's a house on that property, there will be vehicles that come up and down. Uh, zooming back out a little bit. Um, and I believe that covers the, that gist. There are just a couple other things to go over. And we can, of course, come back uh, to this at any point for discussion. Uh, I, I'm not going to read through all of this. Uh, it was included in the submittal, but as far as dimensional regulations go, this site is well under all of the requirements, so we don't come close to maxing out coverage uh, in any way. We've got plenty of room for the setbacks. Um, of course, th this is a demonstration building, so the 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 new you know, the future owner will have to you know get a building permit and still meet the the zoning bylaw requirements. Um, but they will have no problem with coverage, and there's lots of room for a house out there for the flag lot. For the frontage lot with the existing house, similarly, the lot lines have been established, so there are no violations of the zoning bylaw, and we've got you know plenty of coverage, wiggle room, and uh, floor height, uh, setbacks, etc. And then we did do a little bit of additional analysis that um, was mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, but here is a, an excerpt from the swept path analysis where. Uh, I talked to the fire department, found out exactly what vehicle they would want to see to be able to come down. We have no problem getting the town's apparatus to come in, make a clean three-point turn without ever leaving the pavement and leave the site. This is an excerpt from the stormwater management uh, modeling software, just in where we looked at existing proposed conditions, the addition of a basin, uh, infiltration basin. Um, it uh, I think I mentioned most of this, but uh, I will indicate a couple things extra that, um, yeah, up to a two inch rainstorm and most rainstorms, the vast majority of rainstorms are, are less than two inch rainstorms. This site is not going to discharge any water with that new system, um, which which is pretty impressive. And uh, over 1500 cubic feet of water are being recharged. So if this design were, say, beholden to the commercial Massachusetts stormwater standards, uh, that is eight times what the state would require. Similarly, the so the water quality volume is is nearly five times what the state would require. 
So this is a very robust system. And of course, downstream, if you, th this will eventually discharge downstream, downstream of this site and basin um, is about 250 feet of woods before we get into streams and wetlands. Uh, those were the wetlands that prevented Maple Circle from being, uh, or maybe it's Maple Wood Circle, the uh, the development to the north, northwest, uh, well, I guess north, northeast. Uh, that development was stopped because of the wetlands, so there's not much uh, opportunity for development down there. And although it's a little bit small, I'll just say this is an excerpt from the uh, volume analysis, and you, you can see the dark is blue. That is the deepest fill in the backyard, which is where we exceeded five feet of average fill in that magic 2000 square foot window. Um, but the average overall is only 0.62 feet over, over this. Um, and I think that generally uh, covers the highlights of the application. I know there are always lots of details to talk. We're happy to answer any of your questions. Um, and um, I can stop the share or move on to a specific page. I have um, a question. Yeah, Mr. Henry. Um, so Mrs. Sparkle, I, I think I read in the application packet that um, this has been approved at least three times before as a five lot, and this application is almost identical except for a few changes. What is the difference with this application versus the others? It would mostly be the house placement. Um, let's see, the previous application, the 2019 application, uh, that particular uh, project, uh, the, the individual bought the house, uh, but rather bought the property off of Mr. Clay uh, that they had delayed and they, they, the per special permit expired. But when they came back, um, that particular family hosted um, foster children, I believe, uh, or maybe... Mm, Maybe they were they adopted many children. They they needed an enormous house. <laughs> that was it. They were uh, hosting eight or ten children in addition to them. So they had a very large footprint. Uh, so the impact of that that previously approved project was was much larger. They had a bigger driveway, um, more vehicles. It was a much much bigger house. I think something like twice the size. Um, it was really kind of enormous understandable if you're trying to get you know 10 12 people under one roof but uh the main change from at least that last version is that this is a much smaller project um, than what was previously approved and part of the comments which i imagine you'll hear about in a little bit there's concerns um and I, and I saw that you had vegetation added um to separate from your butters but we did the walkthrough and it is very thickly settled where this flag lot is. Um, will some of those trees that are there now still offer that privacy to your abutters? Well, any tree that, that isn't removed absolutely has the opportunity to uh, uh, break up the massing of a house. Uh, it is a mature and open wood. It does, doesn't have very much low ground cover. Uh, thing about open woods is that the trees are 40, 50 feet apart. So you can get an awful lot of house in between trees. Um, so the, the trees will, will add to that. This particular layout um, is designed to sort of minimize the expense of the driveway and the utilities. So the house is, it also allows for a backyard to be behind the house, uh, so to speak. So exactly how the the future house lays on the land is going to have a strong impact on the its exact visual uh, impact on the abutting properties. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Sparkle, can we go back to the um, driveway? Can you widen the, yes. the view here? Yes. Um, through the access road? Yep. Through the access so, road. Yeah, there so we are. The, the stem of the pipe. Um, the st or stem of the flag. <laughs> oh, the oh. Um, yeah. you, so you got it. Yep, I got, got it. it. I got it. Okay. You got it. So one of the comments I noted said that earlier versions of this plan, and, you know, I, I'd have to, I, I, I don't remember, even though I was on the board, about the specifics of the driveway. But that the driveway was closer to the 
to 47 Redgate, then to 63 Redgate. And this is a new, this is a different plot for the driveway. Can you speak um, to that? And is that, is that correct? And is there any ability to move closer to, instead of the driveway gently curving towards 63 Redgate and on, is there an opportunity for the driveway to be, to have a more uh, sharper turn in, but then closer to the, 40, the um, property at 47 Redgate? I, I think I hear that. Um, I didn't, I took, just stole my own design. This driveway is unchanged from the last time I submitted the CAD. The only thing I changed was the grading in the main building area. So mm -hmm. my recollection is there, there's there been no change whatsoever. I do want to point out, and I'll zoom in a little bit here, that there is a very substantial prominent tree that is visible from the street and uh, almost all the houses up and down uh, Redgate Lane, and this is a, a 38 inch diameter white pine tree, which Mr. Clayt has worked very hard to preserve his his parking for his home and his his, his home office uh, many years ago was catered around to protect this tree. So there is benefit to the neighborhood to maintain this tree. And if we bring the driveway closer to that tree, that tree is a goner. We did have it evaluated. Uh, by an arborist and this layout is about the best that we can do considering the additional trenching that will be necessary. Um, so there's there's a very strong motivation to protect that particular uh, spe uh, specimen. So is is the trench the trenching can only be can only happen on the right hand side of the driveway? Could it happen on the left hand side? Well, the water and sewer have to be at least ten feet apart. Um, so you, you're automatically basically spanning the driveway. Um, the, yeah. So we, we can't just jam it all to one side. Got it. And is that white pine currently thriving? What was, that is what, my understanding. What did the arborists say about its, its likely life and how it's doing? Um, I didn't uh, actually converse myself with the arborist. That was Mr. Clay. He had somebody come out because he had concerns about that driveway and how to protect it. Um, you know, I, I see that he has his hand raised, so hopefully he yep. would be able to speak directly he to can that. Speak. Yes, Mr. Mr. Clayton. Uh, yes, I actually consulted with two arborists, and uh, their opinion is that the tree is very, very healthy presently, and it can be preserved if the excavation is done carefully and as far from the root display as is reasonably possible. If we can get at least 15 or 20 feet away, from the, the prominent trunk of the tree, we have a very good shot at having that tree preserved. Thank you, Mr. Clay. Mr. Meadows. I have a couple of questions. Uh, one, perhaps fairly simple, which is what, where does the runoff on the, from the driveway go to? Um, okay. And secondly, what type of evergreens are you talking about? Uh, all right, so the, we'll start with the runoff question. Um, I'll zoom in a little bit to the main grading plan. Um, so uh, we have uh, ditches that come down both sides of the driveway. Some water is going to move to the north of the house. Some water is going to move to the south of the driveway. In all cases, the way the grading uh, natural grades go and the way this plan is established, this be, uh, path becomes a ditch. It's accentuated uh, once we get past the fill, so it is remains uh, the path of least resistance. So a lot of the water is going to come up through the north side, does not leave the property. Similarly, the water is going to come down around this end of fill. There is uh, This is the far end of the swale that is designed to bring water northward. Um, this is the local low point for the uh, entire house. Um, so our entire property. So that's where this is located and how to get to that location. Um, and as I, I mentioned before, uh, during storms that are in excess of two inches, there will be some discharge of stormwater from the site, um, you know, far less than any of the neighbor homes are discharging. And that's gonna go pretty much straight to a wetland. Um, and then in terms of uh, the species, uh, this, you know, I, the indication on the plan is that it is a minimum 10 foot tall evergreen. Um, I, I didn't want to jam anybody's future plans for their dream home into having one special type of tree 
There are a whole variety of trees and species and shrubs that you would be able to intermix and, and utilize. Soil type may matter, you know, the, the amount of sunlight they get matters. So I would rather that a, a true landscape professional make those decisions. I just have a performance requirement um, such that it is it is at least 10 foot tall and evergreen. Mr. Clay, did you wish to speak? Your hand was raised. I'm sorry, I had neglected to lower my hand from when I spoke previously. <laughs> All right, thank you. It's, that is hard to remember. I, I sometimes have a hard time uh, not muting myself. Um, Mr. Sparkle, the round circle on this um, rendering, is that mm -hmm. the housing circle? And that That is, that? Uh, I believe it's section 6.3 of the zoning bylaw that governs flag lots and the same for uh, frontage lots where they're in order to assure that there is a, a reasonably shaped building area um, in addition to setbacks, the standard you know, side, front, rear yard setbacks, that the geometry of the lot must contain a circle equivalent to the frontage of the underlying zoning. And this circle is uh, meaningfully larger, maybe by 50 feet. Um, I'm, so it, that's, that's the purpose for the circle is just to prove that the lot geometry uh, does meet the zoning bylaw. And Ms. Breastrup, the house doesn't have to sit within the building circle, correct? The entirety of the house does not have to sit within the building circle? I understand that is the latest interpretation by the building commissioner, yes. Okay. And Mr. Sparkle, why, just out of, out of curiosity, um, why have why sit, situate the house here and not over closer to where it says that what, what you know 168 over to the right um mm -hmm. it, it, why did you choose that spot and right this this particular location yeah. um again in, in a lot of ways it's efficiency if, if you notice that you know when you come down the access strip you are you're you know you're, you're right here and we want to make the driveway as short as possible and have uh, is the lot really as high as possible up on the land. Um, we did some test holes down here. It's actually very shallow groundwater. So the lower down the hill the building goes, the more that structure is going to have to battle groundwater. And if we were to put the house over here, it is lower. Um, it also decreases the opportunity for a level backyard without clear cutting pretty much the rest of the site. And the backyard becomes a side yard. Um, but the, the, those were the motivations to to uh, situate the property here. It's also a little easier to screen when you have it closer to the lot line um, because the, the open woods you know, provides limited screening. Okay. Yeah, it looks to me like it's about at the same height as you go across from 65 across. I mean, that's not our decision where you put it. Just I'm interested in that. It looks like it's a viable alternative off to the side, but that's not where the demonstration house is right now. Okay. It's also okay. steeper over here, and you'll notice that the contours, it's, it's twice oh, yeah, as I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to be down there. I was talking about over to the right, over to the... Yes. Coast. Yeah, over in that, that exactly in that area, mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. which would be about the same height, but maybe it's... I'm not sure it would be steeper, but it would be around the same height. Okay. Do other people have are there other questions from members of the board? Ms. Breshka, is there anything else that we should be giving consideration to or asking questions from the applicant regarding this? Um, I had uh, sent you the um, special permit for CBA 2019-07, and the questions that I was going to ask had to do with um, the fact there was a condition on that permit that said, a revised driveway plan indicating the paved area being shifted toward the south property line shall be submitted to inspection services and the fire department for approval. Um, so, but I, I believe that Mr. Sparkle has uh, answered the question as to why in this iteration he didn't choose to shift the driveway towards the south because of the um, desire to save the pine tree. So that was one thing I was going to ask. 
Um, another thing I was going to ask was about screening along the north property line, but um, he does have uh, screening shown along the north property line. That was a another condition of 2019-07, which said, yeah. you know, asked about that. And then um, additional landscaping between elevation 88 and 95, and I believe that he has shown that um, here on the plan between 88 and 95. So he's complying with that condition of the previous permit. Um, so I, I don't really have any questions at this point. Another, along with the driveway issue, one of the comments I, I heard was um, a desire for some kind of a berm along the side of the, so I guess that'd be the, the north side of the driveway over by 63 Redgate. It's the creation of some sort of berm and additional um, additional screening along that side, and, and in some cases a fence, temporary fence during construction. Have you given any thought, number one, are you aware of those comments, and maybe you'll hear it in public comments, are you aware of those, and have you given it, if so, have you given that any thought? Um, this, this is the first time I'm hearing any of the public comments for this application, um, and as, as was indicated from you know, the previous conditions, and we, we did give consideration and just automatically offered the same vegetative screen through here. There is not a lot of space to do a berm. Um, and I find that berms are also great ways to take the root zone of vegetation and lift it up out of the moisture of the earth. And there's a very high failure rate and, and usually low health for vegetation that's grown on a berm. Um, and I don't know that anybody wants to, to have a six foot tall pile of earth here. And there certainly isn't room for that to, to fit um, between these two properties, which is why we want with a vegetative screen. Okay. Anyway, all right. Other comments from other board members before we go to public? Uh, Ms. Restro. Yeah, I wanted to apologize to, for not having sent the comments to Mr. Sparkle and Mr. Clayt. Um, you know, in the rush of compensating for Rob Wachilla's leaving, we didn't cover all the bases. So um, we did put them into the packet for this um, meeting for the Zoning Board of Appeals members, but I don't think we called attention to that packet uh, for Mr. Clayt and Mr. Sparkle. So we'll, um, <clears throat> I don't know if it'll make any difference after this, but we'll make sure that they get those comments or, or links to those comments. Thank you, Chris. You always do a great job, and I'm used to uh, managing on the fly during these meetings anyway. Okay, uh, if there are no other questions from the board and nothing else from the, from the applicant, uh, we could open this up to public comment. So for, if you wish to speak to this issue, uh, this application, please so indicate by raising, using the raise hand function on your screen. When you're recognized, the staff will assist in, in uh, bringing you on live onto the, uh, the end of the meeting. When you're so recognized, please give your name and address for the record. Uh, try to keep your comments to around three minutes. Um, and I, I will help you do that by starting a timer on my phone. So, um, and then I make all your comments addressed to the board and not to the individual applicant. So um, Pam, can you bring over the first mm -hmm. person who has sure. their hand raised? And I think that is Mary Anderson. Mary Anderson. Hi, Mary, can you unmute yourself? Mary, there. Okay. Mary, I, yeah, that, there wasn't any symbol on here for me to unmute. I kept just banging. So thank you for sending me that. Okay. Um, uh, and I did send a letter to Mr. Wadzilla. So um, it may be, it didn't make it to the rest of you. I just sent it in today. But I basically was endorsing the um, comments that were sent in by other people regarding both of these. My name is Mary hey. Anderson. I'm sorry for being backwards. My name is yeah. Mary Anderson. I own the property at 191 North Whitney Street, which is behind the site that we're discussing now. And my main question is, 
I'm wondering, is any work going to be done on this lot before it's purchased or will all the work start after it has been purchased and a new permit approved? Okay, that's something that they can respond to after your comments, but we don't have an interactive, we don't have an interactive comment and question period. Um, the, the petitioner can respond to your question after your comments. Oh, okay. All right, yeah. well, that was basically what I was concerned for. Uh, okay. I'm also concerned about the water that would be coming down, but it sounds, according to Mr. Sparkle, like that won't be an issue. So I think that was my main concern was the increased water flow when the trees are cut down and all that construction goes on, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's hardscaping going on. So that was my main concern was the water flow onto my property or the adjacent property then going to the wetlands and whether or not any work would be done before the lot is sold and a new permit acquired. Thank you. Got it. So just for clarity, the, the applicant can choose to respond to those questions at the end of the public comment period when we come back to the applicant for response. Um, the next hand I see is a Mr. Kurt Wise. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep, you sure can. Um, so, uh, I am along with uh, my partner, Rachel Brody, uh, we own and rent the, uh, house next door, 63 Redgate Lane. Um, I think arguably, uh, our property and, um, the tenants who live there, uh, are going to be most impacted by, uh, creation of this flag lot. And then, uh, a house behind the, you know, on that flag lot and the construction process, um, the you know couple of general comment. Um, I feel like there's a, a significant cost to a butter. Mr. Wise, we've lost you there. Can you um... feel like uh, you know? I would strongly encourage the ZBA to look at this as a process of compromise. Um, the uh, clates, um, if this flag lot is approved, uh, are going to essentially get the uh, the primary item that they are interested in. Um, but that there should be significant conditions um, placed on what can be built, uh, how it can be built, et cetera, and that a lot of deference should be paid to uh, concerns and interest raised by a butter. So that this, in fact, is uh, a compromise that allows it to be uh, somewhat tolerable to those of us that um, are you know, going to be living with uh, both the construction and the aftermath of this. Um, I have a fairly, you know, a, a detail list that I sent in as comments. I'm not sure I could get through these in three minutes. Um, but uh, two they things. The highlights. We have your, we do have your, your. Yeah. That, thank you very much. And I would strongly, you know, I would very much, uh, I would ask that the, the board look at those carefully and consider them carefully. Um, two things I'll note. One, uh, I think it's important that uh, if and when this property gets sold and a plan gets developed, that uh, it's a requirement that who the, that the pur purchaser come back to the ZBA um, with a plan as part of a public hearing, not a public meeting, so that there can be give and take um, with uh, abutters about what that plan is specifically, and so that abutters have uh, the right um, to comment on that plan. Um, so that's item number one. Um, you know, I, I speaking directly about the driveway, that's one of the you know principal concerns. This is going to run the entire length of uh, the property next to 63 Redgate, um, I hear this um, idea that the pine has to be saved, uh, and I'm sympathetic to that. On the other hand, a very simple way to save the pine is to not um, construct the driveway in the first place. Um, you know, I will also say that there was an approved plan last time, specifically stamped approved for the driveway, pushed hard down to the southern uh, uh, portion of that um, post for the flag. Uh, it seems to me that uh, engineering Creative engineering could both save the flat, save the pine if this flag lot were to be approved, and shift the driveway in large measure, if, uh, if not at the very point where it uh, touches 63 Redgate, to bend down and run along the far, the southern edge of that flag um, pole post, whatever, however that's referred to. Um, so those are, you know, I guess I will. Um, you know, another thing I guess I want to raise here as a as an issue is the building process, and I would ask that um, the ZBA consider and and uh, require as part of any construction process, you know, very specific limitations on the height, 
um, the flip of the building, the square footage of the building, and uh, um, uh, times and days when construction can happen. So that this isn't just an endless uh, process for the people who are living directly uh, next to this, and that it's happening at all hours of the day and night, um, happening on weekends, holidays, et cetera. So uh, again, I'll close there. It sounds like my three minutes are up. Um, and I guess I, I will just note that uh, my neighbor, Mr. Kevin Gallagher, was apparently kicked off of the, um, the Zoom call and has not been able to get back onto it. He's here with me. Uh, he submitted a letter. He hopes to comment, but he you know, is not actually in the meeting because he was kicked out of the meeting. So, Mr. Wise, um, thank you for your comments um, and for your attention to the time limits. Uh, I don't have a, I don't know why how Mr. Gallagher was was um, removed from the the list, but I think he can speak if he wishes to speak. He can use your mic, and we can do it at this point as long as he gives his name and an address. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, my name is Kevin Gallagher, sixty-eight Maplewood Drive. Um, I'm the, and my wife, Christy Anderson, um, are the abutters to the north. And, um, um, I also, I also submitted a letter, which apparently, um, was not presented to you. I'm not sure why, um, I sent it this afternoon to planning at Amherst to the, the planning general address. Um, We'll just run through your run through your points. I, I regret that I lost yeah. your letter, but give us some give us your high points. So um, this lot is not in keeping with the the character of the existing neighborhood. Um, there's only one flag lot in this neighborhood, um, 191 North Whitney, and it's significantly larger. It's 13 acres compared to this one, which is not even an acre. Um, Further, the proposal does has been designed in such a way that will minimize the impact to Mr. Clayt, the applicant, um, and kind of maximizes the impact um, on the other abutters. The proposed house is, you know, tight in the northwest corner. Um, all the trees um, are to be cleared, um, except for um, the area of undisturbed um, vegetation is um, along the south edge, which happens to be the, um, in the property line with Mr. Clayt. Um, now, the grade changes on average may be only um, a few inches, but you know, in some places it's more than eight feet of fill, which is quite a dramatic um, change and is gonna be quite apparent from our property. Um, and the fact that there is no actual building, no house, um, makes it difficult to offer more specific um, uh, comments um, on the proposal. Um, I would echo Kurt's um, request that if you do approve the, 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 um, the flag lot that um, a actual building plan be presented to the ZPA that this is an, a requirement for um, a public hearing, not a public meeting, with um, actual building plan, um, and um, so that we can comment on it. Um, with also a landscaping plan, an actual landscaping plan, not just a kind of schematics proposal. Um, Um, and other conditions that Kurt outlined in, in his letter that, um, the permit shall have a, a limit, a time limit on it, um, and, um, that there be specific requirements around, um, the construction, um, when construction can take place, uh, All right, Mr. Gallagher, um, can you wrap up? You um, get the three minutes. Specific limits on, okay. Yep, you can wrap up. Um, so um, that's pretty much it. Um, I, in general, 
I think that it's it's not appropriate for the neighborhood, but if you do appro approve the uh, flag lot, um, I think there should be significant restrictions. Um, and the, if you'd like to refer to the letter, I'm sure it's in the, the inbox of the, the planning department. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. White. Um, if I could just speak real quickly, if we're referring to the letter from Kevin and Kevin Gallagher, Christy Anderson, that is in our packet and we've reviewed it, or at least I have. <laughs> I think, I think you're, you're ahead of me, Mr. White. I've read the other letters, but we'll look at it. Um, it that's the one that came in this afternoon, correct, Mr. White? I I also have it. Okay. Well, I just didn't download it, I guess, and I will go to my email and, and pull it up. Uh, Pam, I have you, it also. Yep. Pam, can you send it to me? I just don't have it on my in my packet. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. White, for um, making that clear. Ms. Brestro, before we go on to other public comments. Yeah, I just wanted to note for the public that it's hard for staff when letters come in, you know, late in the afternoon on a night when we're holding a public hearing because we're getting ready for the public hearing and, um, you know, we can't be checking our email all the time. And so I just wanted to encourage members of the public to send um, anything that they have to say really the day before the meeting. But if you have to send it the day of the meeting, please send it by noontime so we can check our email, find it, and then send it along and do the right thing with it because it is hard for us to um, keep up with last minute um, submittals. Thanks. Great. That's a good point, Ms. Brestrup. Thank you very much. And we are um, kind of dealing with shorthanded right now, so everybody's working overtime to get everything into the packets. Um, we have, I see two more hands up. Gail Furst. Um, can you please give us your name and address and speak to the issue? Hi, uh, my name is Yael Fierst. I live in on 63 Redgate Lane. We are renting the house from Gordon Rachel. Um, we've been living here for five years. We just uh, extended our lease for another year. Um, I just want to reiterate my concerns that, that our concerns that we um, shared in the letter that we shared with you a few days ago. Um, about the safety, especially with the driveway, right? So we have two young kids. Um, the youngest is six year old. He's neurodivergent. Um, currently, with the way that you know you saw probably in the side visit, um, the backyard is pretty self contained, right? Uh, if there were like a driveway going through, um, like just next to the whole um, the whole backyard, that will make it really impossible for us to let him play um, outside uh, without like close supervision. Um, so to that extent, uh, we have concerns about the construction phase and about the long-term uh, plan, right? So during construction, we really want to emphasize that we really need to have um, a safety fence, like that is more hard duty, like, uh, you know, harder duty than um, like um, evergreen or whatever, because really there's going to be a lot of traffic and construction and uh, trades people coming in and out. And we really want to have like a, a very, you know, physical barrier between the construction zone, which is the driveway and our yard. And then, you know, long, longer term, it's great that you guys added the, um, the, the you know, um, proposed uh, proposal added the privacy screens with evergreens. I just wanted to um, clarify, right? Like, it's great that it's going to be 10 feet tall, but at what point, right? Like, they, I think the requirement should be at the moment that it is erected or planted, that should be 10, uh, 10 foot, foot tall, not like plant something, wait several years, and only then it reaches the 10 uh, foot high. Uh, we really need something that's in place immediately to make sure that you know safety and privacy are actually in place. Um, and um, my oh yeah, and sorry, one last thing. Um, yeah, just like in, the t in terms of like the timeline, right? Just make sure that everything um, is done in a in, as a condensed way as possible, as um, you know, other um, comments made. Um, Thank you. Thank you. And I see Mary Anderson, you have your, you still have your hand up. Um, you've already spoken if I'm correct. And unless there's 
and you didn't use it your, all your time, so you, you probably have a minute if you wish to speak again. I don't think. There we go. Okay, yep. can you hear? Me? Okay, yep. uh, two things, two quick things. One, 191 is not a flag lot. So this would be the only flag lot in the whole area. 191 is not a flag lot. That's the first thing. Um, and the second thing, I'm impressed up. I will just resend my letter to you in the morning and then you'll have it for your packet. Thanks. Basically, it endorses the objections that everybody else has raised to the project, but okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Okay, um, this is the opportunity for um, the applicant to respond to any of the public comment uh, that they wish. And then after that, for the board to ask for the questions before we go to a public hearing. Sure. Absolutely. Okay, happy to do so. I, I took several notes here. I'm going to be you know, referring to them, um, and I guess in order. And the, the first thing was uh, Mary Anderson's comment, wondering about uh, if any work is going to happen prior to sale of the property. Uh, my understanding is no, that is not the intention. Um, if that is not Mr. Clate's uh, thought, I totally invite him to speak up and, and uh, express otherwise. But my understanding is at this point, he just wants to you know, depart with this a &R lot that was created in 2005 and uh, somebody else can take the project on. So I don't believe any work is gonna be happening before the sale. Um, and uh, a condition of, you know, potentially having a new public hearing of effectively means that this special permit, you know, that doesn't mean anything. Like we, we are here during the public hearing process so if somebody else comes along and wants to buy a property, um, but they have the onerous obligation to go through a public hearing process to have the exact little details uh, of the, the structure and the layout being scrutinized, but all the neighbors, that that is a, a pretty significant um, uh, uh, requirement for that to be. Uh, and I would say, that, you know, it's the kind of thing that puts the very sale of the house potentially in jeopardy because it means that you're not actually buying a lot that you can build on. You're buying a lot that maybe you can build on. And then all the neighbors get to tell you what you get to do on your property. So that that seems um, like quite quite an onerous uh, request there. Um, you know, in addition to you know comments on you know uh, you know where the house is going to be or or the details on the house, and we we do have you know architectural details, landscape plans. The, um, the town does have a set of bylaws that regulate all of these things that are deemed to be fair and appropriate for a variety of uses. Single family homes have uh, some amount of requirements, but generally, you know, people who own land, you know, they have a degree of uh, sovereignty over their own property. And as long as they follow the bylaws of the town uh, and aren't creating any nuisances, it, it doesn't seem reasonable for some future owner to have to do something that it is highly unlikely any other member of this neighborhood has ever had to do or would want done to them and their homes. Um, in terms of character of the neighborhood, what we're talking about, you know, is, is, you know, yes, it is a flag lot, but the character of the neighborhood is, is the homes, it's the drive, it's the landscaping. So the political boundaries of, of properties vary dramatically all over town, all over this neighborhood. So the, the character is a single family home. So it is very much within the character and the zoning use. Um, and uh, in, in terms of impact to abutters, uh, I know in the past, and I believe I believe quite recently, and again, if Mr. Clays, uh, you know needs to correct me, that's fine. Um, uh, I believe he offered the abutters opportunity to invest or buy in or, or, or prevent this, um, this opportunity uh, from happening. Uh, understanding it, it does take a fair amount of financial resources to just buy a piece of land at market rate, but the the abutters all did have a chance to, you know, to weigh in on this and and have control over this property, um, and it seems understandably that you know at least not enough of them were able to to pull that off, but this has not been done in a vacuum, and um, Mr. Clay is very well aware of his neighbor's concerns. Um, and yeah, in terms of having a reviewed landscape plan, again, this is a, a single family residence, not a commercial site plan. Um, having, you know, performance details on the types of vegetation 
particularly for screening needs, that makes an awful lot of sense. Uh, but, but picking exactly which plant by committee in a public hearing, that, that seems to go beyond the pale. Um, there, it is pretty much impossible to buy 10 foot tall landscape screenings. Um, the larger the vegetation, the, the harder it is to actually transplant. Uh, so, you know, this is how vegetative screening works. You, you buy it when it is small and manageable and human beings can pick these things up and plant them in the ground and they have undeveloped root systems and then they develop the root systems and grow. That is the natural process for vegetative screening. It's, it is not practical to bring in a 10 foot tall anything and stick it in the ground and think it's going to live. Uh, all, all of that is is pretty, pretty extreme. Um, and uh, I think those were most of the comments that uh, I, I wanted to address. I do see Mr. Clay's hand up, so um, perhaps he can he can offer something that I've uh, not been able to add. Uh, sure. So am I recognized to speak then? Yep, Mr. Clay, go ahead. Thank you. So uh, hi, neighbors. And uh, I've wanted nothing more for my uh, than and for my 32 years living in this location, uh, than comedy in the neighborhood. Uh, uh, Mr. Sparkle is correct that I did twice before offer to all the Could you make sure you're addressing your comments to the board, not <laughs> not too right. right. So I would want the board then to know this history. I'm sorry mm -hmm. uh, that uh, that yes, I have offered uh, the possibility to the neighbors to consult with me about the possibility of subdividing this parcel, which would not require them purchasing the entire parcel as a building lot, because I would retain part of it as continued screening as part of my residential lot, so that it could be divided in three, two or three or four parcels, which would disable the possibility of it ever being a building lot. Essentially, I have done that myself at my own expense for all of these many years now. In fact, the last time the lot was sold and it was bought by the, the previous buyer, and when I learned of the previous buyer's plans to build a much larger, more obtrusive house than we're now proposing and asking to be permitted, I bought the lot back from him for the purpose of continuing to preserve that open space for my own pleasure and for the pleasure of everyone else in the neighborhood. And I've maintained it now for another four or five years, but I have reached the time in my life where I really must conclude this and recover my in expenses for this lot. It's not so much as profiteering by making profit. I bought the lot back. I need to recover those resources. And if anyone in the neighborhood wishes to join with me in preserving the open space, rather than having a house there, the door will be open to them to approach me so that we can have a conversation about that. Thank you, Mr. Clay. Um, questions from the questions or comments from members of the, of the board regarding the public comments or the response from the applicant? <laughs> Mr. Sloger. Well, I, I'd like to respond to the last thing that Mr. Clayt said. It's, it strikes me as a bit unfair to assert that the neighbors are somehow complicit in this not continuing as an undeveloped lot because they are not buying parts of the lot. When they bought their homes, they did not expect to have to buy neighboring parcels, I have to presume, in order to protect themselves. So that strikes me as a bit of a, of a disingenuous approach to try and hold the neighbors in any way responsible for selling this lot. If Mr. Clay wants to keep it as an undeveloped property, he simply can not sell the property and keep it as part of his existing uh, property and not divide it. So I'm uh, I'm not entirely comfortable with this approach. If if he had to buy it back, it's because he sold it in the first place. So this seems to me to be an effort 
to maximize a financial gain, which I don't have an issue with. I'm just responding to the the last part. There are other aspects of this property that are in fact troubling after listening to the neighbors and that this will be disruptive. Uh, a long driveway so close to the neighbor is with lights and traffic is an issue. Uh, I don't know if a single family home built on this property will will always be occupied by a family. Could it be rented to four unrelated students? I don't know. I don't know if that's a restriction we can put on it. But this flat, this lot and this building seems to me to have the potential for significant disruption to the abutters. That's Mr. it for now. That's it for now. Mr. Meadows? Um, I, I find it difficult. I, for one, I'm not even certain what we're voting on, uh, what we would be approving. I, I We're approving theoretical evergreens in a, for a theoretical house in a theoretical location. It seems to me that this is considerably premature as far as an approval is concerned. Uh, in, in the past, what's come before us are actual designs for houses in specific locations. Um, this is not such. Miss, um, there is a process here of, of approving a, a flag lot, and that's what that's what we're going through. And it's a, I think Miss Brestrup can answer the question of why we have the application before us now, and to what extent um, you'd be able to condition the approval of this flag lot on condition the approval of this flag lot on. Um, landscape plans or other kinds of things at this point, or doing it at a later point in time, coming back with a special permit or a hearing, um, and where things have to be approved by the, the board at a later, pl a later place in time. But in the past, Mr. Meadows, this, this lot, flag lot has been approved. Um, and so that, that's, that's what we're looking at. And I understand, I do understand your, um, confusion or, or anxiety here that you don't know really what you're approving at this point because you're just approving a, a flag lot and a potential a potential structure without any kind of information about that or any, any specifics on the screening that we normally would see. So maybe Ms. Okay. Brestro, you can kind of enlighten us here as to the process and why this is before us as it is. I think that flag lots are treated differently. As you say in your introduction, um, there's not a precedent for each of these projects because they are special permits and they're discretionary. And there is a reason why they're discretionary. Um, often when you are reviewing a flag lot, you do review a general location of the house, uh, location and grading plan for the driveway and a grading plan for the property. Um, and then you uh, place conditions on the uh, approval that the applicant shall come back um, with um, plans for the house once it's decided what kind of house you're going to build and um, elevations of the house to show the zoning board and then um, perhaps a landscape plan once it's been worked out. So those things um, can be conditioned to come back to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, there are different ways they can come back. They can come back at a public meeting. So the Zoning Board has an opportunity to review them, or they can come back at a public hearing. That doesn't mean the filing of a new application. What it means is that um, the uh, there would be a need for a legal ad and notification of abutters. So abutters would have an opportunity to come to a meeting such as this, when the zoning board is a, is reviewing the house and the location and the landscaping, and they could comment too. So it's up to you as to whether you want to have it um, just be at a public meeting or a public hearing. Um, but I think it is common that you would approve a plan such as this with those types of conditions that the applicant would come back once or the, the new owner 
um, would come back once they know what house they want to build and once they know um, what the landscaping is going to be and also lighting. This plan doesn't show any lighting as far as I know. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Um, and then they would show those to you and you would approve those in incrementally after approving the flag lot. So that's uh, that's how I would explain it. I wonder then why the flag light is starts with the pole on the north side of the of the plates house of uh, forty seven Redgate instead of to the south side of it, where there is no problem with a large pine tree and could not instead encompass a an area that doesn't have the the grading, or maybe it does, and how that could be dealt with as opposed to a flag light that is causing some trauma to the people in 40, I can't see this very well, 40, 63. 53. Yeah. Is there an alternative? Mr. Sparkle, can you elucidate on that? Um, I must admit, um, uh, we haven't, I haven't evaluated personally options to come to the south. I do know that this is also a heavily vegetated wooded area. Uh, I know that putting of access through here uh, would, you know, would substantially alter uh, Mr. Clayt's existing homestead um, and would still require a fair amount of, of vegetation removal. Um, and, you know, like I said, this is the configuration that has been approved multiple times over the years. So to to reinvent the wheel did not make an awful lot of sense to us. Um, and you know, as 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 we moved into this, you know, doing what what has worked in the past certainly made the most sense to us. And and I'm I'm sure there would be you know meaningful vegetation uh, disturbance through here. I believe this is a heavily landscaped area, um, and I can see that. Mr. Clay has his hand up, so uh, I think he's probably best suited to to speak further on that at this point. Well, yes, I actually wasn't going to speak about that particular point about bringing bringing power utilities in from the other side. I did want to speak to the question of uh, what would be a reasonable expectation in terms of the future of, of the lot at the time that I bought it, or the reasonable expectations for myself or any of my other neighbors in regard to what could happen on this site. This lot, just as when I originally bought it and bought 63 Redgate Lane at the same time and sectioned it off, I did this with the understanding that we were meeting the requirements for a flag lot. Of course, it would need to be applied for and it would need to be approved of, but in general, the parameters were in place. So just as I understood this, all of the local owners nearby and the abutters have had the same opportunity to understand this. And then, of course, since it has been thrice permitted, everybody understood that this has been a permitted building lot. And that's why we came back this time with precisely the same boundaries as before, except with more consideration than a smaller house than was permitted in the past. So I do think that it was reasonable, really more so, uh, for me to have the understanding when I bought a lot back after it had been thrice permitted that it would be most likely permitted in the future that there wasn't great financial risks to be taken since you had previously permitted the lot three times. Thank you, Mr. Clay. Mr. Henry, you had your hand up. I, I do, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, so while I understand the concerns of the abutters, um, I, I do not believe that um, all the asks that is in, that are, that are being made here are reasonable. I, I think um, that three times approved by the zoning board, it went through the process. The lot qualifies; it falls within the bylaws. Um, it was approved on. Nothing has changed. Um, I, I appreciate that. Um, there is um, a bit of a, the abutters may be used to, there's no development there, they enjoy that, but there's an expectation that if you own a property, you have the right to do the property what you will, as long as it conforms to the bylaws of the town that you live in. 
and my understanding from reading the project application, as well as reading the project application report draft, um, all that's been required from Mr. Clayt is within the bylaws. So I, I, I don't, um, I, I take, um, I heard Mr. Silver said that, um, how can we guarantee that any house built is not gonna be rented to students? Um, I, I, I don't think that's a fair question. Um, it, if, if the owner wants rented to students, that is his prerogative, if it's zoned for that purpose. I mean, the one of the abutters who made a public comment is a renter. They don't own the property there. So it's not such, such saying that everyone that lives there owns the property. There's a renter who made a comment about a fence for their children. Um, so I don't think that was appropriate to say, to put limitations on this. Um, again, it, while I understand the whole, um, you know, you gave the abutters the opportunity to buy the lot. Um, yes, that's reasonable. But I don't think you have to do that or should have had to do that. Um, you buy a house in a neighborhood. There's an expectation that at some point, somebody may sell the house, somebody else may move in. Or if there's a vacant lot next to you, there has to be the reasonable expectation that at some point, something may go on that lot. And so when you when you move into that neighborhood, you have that expectation. And I don't think what is being applied for is overly burdensome to anyone. Again, it has been before the zoning board on three separate occasions. Um, I imagine that the people that heard those three separate applications were three different zoning panels and it was approved because again, what's being requested falls within the bylaws. So I think if I read the room correctly, we board members have been able to respond, to ask questions that they wanted to ask at this point in time. Um, the petitioner has been able to respond to the questions and the comments from the public. And I would think that it's time for us to move into a public hearing on our public meeting on this. Um, we're also coming on 7.30, which we take our normal five minute break. So what I would what I would propose is that we close the public hearing. No, excuse me. We we move to a public meeting while keeping the public hearing open, in case we need to have further information, and that we um, come back after that motion is approved. We take a five minute break and come back and uh, talk about um, whether we can come to a decision tonight on this matter or whether we should move to the, the next matter. So what I'd like to do then is I would entertain a motion that we move to public meeting while keeping the public hearing open on this matter. Do I have such a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Aye. I hear it's moved and seconded. Any discussion? If there's no discussion, the vote occurs on the motion. The chair votes aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Okay. So then what I intend to do is we're going to have a, a five minute break. We'll come back and open the public meeting on this matter. We'll discuss whether we'll be able to finish this shortly or whether we should um, uh, continue this to the next meeting. And then we have another, another um, application we have to discuss yet tonight. So I'll see you all back in five minutes. That would be about, by my watch, 7.36. All right, see you all in five minutes.
Okay, it's, uh, I see that it's 7.38, I'm a couple minutes late, sorry guys, um, are we all back? Mr. Meadows is yet to come back, but we have... Oh, I'm here. Oh, all right, we're all here. All right, so now we're in the public meeting portion of the, this consideration of this application, and this is a list of the place where the board generally deliberate, gen the board deliberates and it's generally not an opportunity for public comment, uh, unless we need it. Um, so. Here's my thinking on this: is that um, I, I am, I'm inclined to think that Mr. Clayt should be able to um, create this flag lot and dispose of his property or sell his property, sell his property to a, a homeowner. I'm also inclined, and, and and not because of the precedent, but just because it seems to me that it's not an unreasonable thing to wish um, and to look for. But what I am concerned about is some of the effects on the neighborhood and the, and the abutters. And I think there, was, there are some reasonable um, issues that the, I heard in the public comments that could be addressed um, by the, uh, either through conditions or through a, coming back for a special permit for the construction of the actual house. As well as I think there's things that haven't been actually 
mentioned yet or haven't, haven't been specified in the application that could be that are something that the, the board should look at when final approval is given or before construction begins. And for me, those things are, I'm, I'm inclined to, since you have such an, uh, we have a, a driveway right up against a neighboring property um, and you do have young children on that neighboring property, it is not, to me, it doesn't seem unreasonable to have some kind of a fence to protect the kids from running out into the trucks during construction period. And that doesn't have to be a permanent fence, but it should, that seems to me to be a, a reasonable thing to ask. It can be removed at a later point in time. Um, also, um, I think Mr. Sparkle made a good point. You, you can't really put in 10 foot tall, um, 10 foot tall evergreens, but you can, we do routinely talk about the size and, and diameter of the, the screening that we want to put in, that we require uh, applicants to put in, and that we, they do grow. And you, you don't get screening, you don't get 10 foot screening right away, but you do have, you know, four to six foot plants put in and they do grow rapidly if taken care of. So I think that can be, we can require something in that regard, um, or the, the applicant could propose something that would, would uh, give us that. We don't have a, something we don't have here at all is a lighting plan. Um, and we, so we don't deal at all with whether the intrusion on neighbor's property, trespass of light, that, et cetera, seems to be, to be um, absent and something that we almost always do uh, in, these, in uh, consideration of not only single family homes, but all kinds of homes and, and multifamily dwellings. So that's not there as well. And so I think there's a few things that could be worked on either by the applicant coming up or more likely sub in the subsequent hearing uh, before the building, building permit is granted. That's where I'm coming from. I'm not opposed to the flag lot. I am, I do think there's ways to minimize the effect on the, on the abutters and the neighbors. And I'd like to pursue that with both the applicant and with my fellow board members. So that's my general thought on the matter. And I'd like to hear other people's thoughts. The last point is we're getting to 745. The next thing on the agenda is, uh, I think have, there's a lot of public comment. I think we have 21 people in attendance right now. And I think most all of those are people who wish to comment on the next application. And I'd like to get as much of that done as possible tonight. And I think doing all of this, completing this one tonight may be difficult, but if we could get a sense of where the board is going, we could get some direction given to the applicant. Maybe they could come back after discussion with neighbors to some kind of a, a conclusion that would make, make providing the um, approval of the flag lot application more likely. So that's where, so I'd like to do this rapidly if, we, if um, my board members would agree. Mr. Meadows. Uh, I, I again feel that uh, that this is premature. Uh, we don't have enough information. That I, I agree that uh, that the landowners are entitled to uh, have a flying lot and to use the property as they they wish. But I think we we are lacking a good deal of information to make a, a reasonable judgment as to what might be going in there um, and uh, to, to uh, go along with what Mr. Sparkle said, if we put as many conditions on there as we need to make for the next owners to buy this, they're still going to be in the same position as to not knowing whether they're going to be able to build a house or not. So I think it makes more sense to see someone come in here um, with a, with a, a solid plan as to what's going in, as opposed to a lot of theoretical plans as to what might go in. I so you're, are you saying, Mr. Mr. Meadows, that you'd, let, you'd rather see a prospective buyer with a plan come in? Is that what you're looking at? So that, exactly. Okay. Um, Mr. White. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would kind of where I'm at is I agree with your comments, um, a lot of the comments that Mr. Henry made um, in that I do believe, of course, uh, we need to be aware of concerns of the abutters, the neighbors, um, and of the creation of this flag lot. However, I do believe that we can reach a compromise here. Uh, I would like to see, uh, based off of this information, the creation of the flag lot, however, conditionally put in that 
the new owner, uh, whoever was to purchase the lot, would need to come back before the board uh, with full plans on things, you know, a lighting plan, you know, everything, all the sort of things that we generally see. Um, so that at that point, we have more firm details um, and we're able to, like I said, work with the abutters, work with the property, the new property owner and kind of find a, com a compromise through that. But that's kind of where I'm at right now. Yep. Mr. Henry. So thank you, Mr. Chair. My, my concern is that if, if we add these, and, and I know we say conditions, but I think they're limitations. Um, I, I, you know, it's, it limits a buying pool for Mr. Clayt. It's if, a, if, if you list this property and a potential buyer sees this permit and says, wait a second, I'm simply trying to build a single family house in a zone designed for single family and to come back before the zoning board to do all these things. I don't want to. I mean, isn't this isn't what we're doing the appropriate venue? We're creating this flag lot so that Mr. Clint has the opportunity to sell this property and then whomever buys a property goes through the permitting process just like any other person would to build a single family house in a designated single family housing unit. Why isn't that sufficient? Well, the, I mean, the question that I think is a good question, Mr. Henry, um, the point is, is that the place where there's public comment and consideration to um, the effects on the neighborhood is when you grant the public the special permit for the flag lot. And we can either take, and if we want to consider those, the effects on the community, um, which is part of our mandate, it's either now and by putting con conditions, or as you call them, limitations on the flag lot, or we do it at a later point in time. Either time does create a bit of a, it does diminish the attractiveness of the property. I'm, there's no denying that, that you know, you can't put but zoning laws do that generally. I mean, that's, you can't do whatever you want on the property. You have to have single family homes or multifamily homes or commercial or whatever. There's a lot of ways in which zoning rules limit the use of the property. But this is one where, where I think that we're, what I'm hearing from the board is not that they're going to be um, incredibly onerous, but we're looking at at screening, we're looking at fencing, we're looking at a light plan, those kinds of things that are typically fairly normal. And we've done with single family homes, um, you know, a light plan to me, we just, it's, well, it's not, well, it's not um, always precedential setting. We just looked at a house on a very steep a, a home on a very steep um, piece of property. And one of the issues was how the light trespasses onto the neighbors, and we required certain kinds of certain kinds of uh, screening so that that wouldn't happen. We also looked at the the stormwater, which they have done in this case. Those are things we do for single-family homes as well. So, I mean, it's not that we want to. I don't know that this is going to be um, so. We hope. I hope it's not going to be so um, um, difficult that it makes selling of the property impossible, or even onerous on the seller. That's what I think that's what we're looking at. But I'd leave that up to you know what the board would vote. But I think your point is, is well taken. But there's at every you know we do this all the time with special permits is we look at the effect on the neighborhood, anything from lights to noise to whatever it is, to screening of, of trash receptacles, something we routinely do. Mr. Sloviter. Oh, you're, Mr. Slobody, you're. Yeah, I'm, now I'm not. Yes, I thought I had clicked it. I'm sorry. Um, I can support the chair's comments that the property owner is entitled to establish a flag lot, that there have been other favorable rulings to establish a flag lot. I don't see a big difference between a condition and a limitation. They really are both. Uh, they are they are both terms that that define what a property can and cannot do. And I think that our mandate is to both be fair to the property owner 
and to protect the interests of the abutters, some, some points of which I think are very reasonable. Length of construction period, safety during construction, hours of, of uh, operation, all of these things that were defined in one of the letters. So I think that if the sense of the board is that we approve the establishment of the of the flag lot, I can support that. I think at the same time, it is reasonable in order to address the concerns of the abutters and to make sure that we fulfill our mandate to protect the, the quality of life on the street and the abutters that we do place some reasonable conditions on this or limitations, I don't care what you call them. And one of them might very well be, even though it would possibly have a, a chilling effect on, on the sale in the short term, the sale could be contingent upon a plan being approved by the ZBA when they come back with the lighting and the actual dimensions of the house. I think that Mr. Meadows' point earlier uh, that we're looking at a theoretical lot with a theoretical house with a theoretical driveway uh, made a lot of sense to me. This, it, I think, if if they if a prospective buyer has to come to us with specifics or whatever panel is is there, then then it is. Uh, more credible to vote on that well-defined plan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If if I'm, I want to read the consensus here and see what I can and make a proposal for our action. It seems to me that it would be the best. The best response here would be to continue this hearing for a couple of weeks until mid June or three, three weeks or four weeks until mid-June. During that time, I think we could ask the, the applicant to take a look at some of the requests from the neighbors for whether it be fencing or additional screening um, and respond to those one way or the other to give it some consideration. Um, and I think that the other thing that we could do in that time is a fairly limited set of, of, of requirements that would require the uh, a, another hearing on the part of the board for things like that are not particularly onerous, but for the structure on whether it's the lighting plan, whether it's um, if, if, if the grading has changed since they have to do the stormwater analysis, we do that. But just a few discrete things that they, they have to have approved by the board before construction can begin. And that would seem to me to be a, a way in which the property could be sold and you'd have minimal onerous restrictions on its use um, and you'd have the ability to um, also provide some um, uh, satisfaction and, and respond to some concerns of the, of the neighbors, which I think is are legitimate. And so that would be my, and it would give a chance for potentially the neighbors and Mr. Clay to come to, come to, come to some um, agreement on this and also Mr. Sparkle could um, perhaps give some thought to um, if there has to, well, if there has to be uh, additional grading or additional stormwater work done if there is a different sized house put on that property. I mean, you don't know what the house is going to be yet, but if you have a distance, different size, different house size and you have it placed in a different spot, the current um, stormwater isn't going to be, isn't going to be satisfactory. You're going to have to go back to the concom or somebody. You know, somebody you're going to have to deal with that. So um, that's not just us. In the case of a house that's put on that property, so that would be my suggestion: is that we um, allow it some time for uh, consideration of neighbors maybe coming to some compromise and then moving forward in in a month. What is the response for the board members? Because I think right now it's. I'm not sure that the application would pass. It needs four votes. I don't know that there's four votes here for it at its current state. And I don't have time. I don't think we have time tonight to go through all the conditions I would like to go through to consider before we vote on the motion to approve it or disapprove it. I think it makes sense to continue. Yeah. 
Anybody else have an opinion on that? I I agree. I agree. All right, Mr. White. Agreed. Okay, so let's do this. Um, Ms. Brestrup, we have um, a meeting already scheduled for June, is it June 15th? June 13th. We have June, a meeting scheduled for June 13th, but I understand that Mr. Judge will not be available that night. You know, our, our plans have changed. So on the 13th, let me just double check. I think I will be here. Hold on. I am out of the country. You're out of the country on the 13th? Yes. Um, what's the, what's your... How about the 27th? I'm free on the 27th. Mr. White? I'm free. Mr. Slobiter? I'm available. And Mr. Henry? Available also. Okay. And Mr. Meadows, you good with that? Yes. Okay. I am. So let's move this to the, I would say we'll, we can move it to the 27th then. I will say that I am not available on the 27th. Um, the next possible date would be of your regular meetings, July 11th. If I may suggest, I'm not hundred percent sure that Mr. Sparkle's absence, I, I just, yeah. I'm concerned delaying this is- Too long. De delaying Mr. Clay's prospects yeah. as well. So yeah, if that. Mr. Sparkle can submit something to us in writing prior to that date and Mr. Clay can attend. Mr. Clay, could, would you be comfortable in having this meeting on without Mr. Sparkle? I would prefer that he be present because he's so helpful to the process. Um, on the other hand, I would prefer not to delay. So there's kind yeah. of in that. Right. Well, here's what we should do. Let's go and set the date when, even though Mr. Sparkle cannot be there. And if, if we find that his presence was absolutely, if you find his presence and we find his presence was absolutely required, we can move it to the next week or two weeks. What, what but date? we would know that. The what date? date? Is, was that date we had, please? The date we had was which, Ms. Bressler? June 27th, which is a Thursday. I'll be out of the country. You'll be out of the country. I'm sorry to say yes. Well, lucky you, actually. So I'm. <laughs> that's. I hope it's someplace wonderful, and you can forget about all the stuff you're having to do with here. So um, let's see. So looking at this, Miss Brestra, we the 27th doesn't work. How about the 20th for people? That's our not regularly scheduled meet, Thursday meeting, but it's. Um, it's a possibility. How does that work for people's schedule? Uh, I'm sorry to say, I, I, I will be unavailable from the 15th of June until the 1st of July. And the 20th doesn't work for me either. Okay. Um, so what about the 11th of July that we had talked about previously? Yeah. That would work for me. Works for me. But Works for me. I'm available. All right. Yeah. Did everybody, all the yeah. um, ZBA members said they were available? Yeah, the 11th yes. of July. Just go with that. Okay. Just for my own edification, uh, will Mr. Sparkle be available on the 11th as well? We'll be taking eight days off this summer, and you seem to be hitting the nail on the head for those days. <laughs> um, no, I will not be. I, I, And yes, I would prefer to be here. I also believe that I can submit a fair amount of details um, as, as far as details are available at, at this point, uh, particularly, I, I know Steph does a great job of putting together meeting minutes and you'll be able to identify exactly what board members are interested in seeing. I can address those and discuss those with Mr. Clay and um, I guess wish him luck on the 11th. So I, what I would move is that we continue this hearing to July 11th at six o'clock. So okay. moved. Second. Second. Seconded. Mr. Henry moved. Yeah, and Mr. Henry moved. Who seconded? I thought I I thought I heard this. I know I heard a second. There were, I think there it was were Mr. two White. Of us did. It was yeah, Mr. It was White. Mr. White. Because we had 
two people moving it and two people seconding it. So it's great. All right. So it's July 11th at six o'clock. Six o'clock. And one of the things we can do is work with, the staff can work with Mr. Clay and Mr. Sparkle uh, to, to come up with a list of things that we, for our discussion tonight and perhaps any discussion that you have directly with the staff of things that we'd like to consider during that meeting. And that he should, that they might be able to comment on such as a fence or something, some other thing. All right. So the motion occurs, the vote occurs on the motion to continue. All those in favor, vote aye. Chair votes aye. Mr. Sloboder? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. The motion is, the vote is five to nothing. The motion carries. We're continuing this until July 11th at six o'clock. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully we'll have a resolution at that point. The next order of business is FY 2024-18, Mathena Morrissey, a request for a special permit under section 3.3211 of the zoning bylaw to convert a single family dwelling into a non-owner occupied duplex with a requested waiver from the sign plan at 180 North Whitney Street, map 11D, parcel 261, RG, general residence zoning district. This is continued from May 9th, 2024. Um, who is speaking for the applicant tonight? Tom Reedy is here and I believe he's representing the applicant. All right, can you bring him in, Ms. Sadler? Or anybody else? And we also have, I see Ms. Morrissey is also here as well. Okay. You have, you have Tom Barry as well from uh, Kuhn Riddle, if you want to bring him in. Yep. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, who's, well, let's get the names and addresses of all the people that are going to be speaking. We'll get that out of the way and then whoever wishes to present can start. So Mr. Reedy, name and address. Sure. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson out of Amherst, uh, 6 Southeast Street. Mr. Barry. Hello, my name is Tom Barry. I'm an architect at Kuhn Riddle Architects in Amherst. My residential address is 244 Northampton, South Street, Northampton. And Ms. Morrissey. Hi, everyone. Mathena Morrissey, and I'm at 23 Blackberry Lane in Amherst. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Reedy, are you doing the presentation? I am. Okay. You may proceed. Take it away, right? Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, thank you very much. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to talk a little, little bit about the site. Um, Probably a very good segue from the last hearing because we're just down the road, though we're in a completely different zoning district. Um, and then I'll talk about the site plan a little bit, and then I'll turn it over to Tom Barry to talk about the architecture. Then we'll bring it back, talk about management overview. Uh, and obviously, you, you know, at any point, stop us, ask us questions. We're, we're happy to answer. And Mr. Reedy, I think what we're going to try to do is let's, let's see if we can have the presentation in about 20, 30 minutes or so, 30, you know, something. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't see an issue like, getting through it. It's a, and I'd like to get some public comment in as well. Totally, yeah, yeah, we can we can certainly do that. All right, uh, so first, I'll just share my screen. Um, if you can see where the cursor is, the yellow highlight, this is 180 North Whitney Street uh, in Amherst. You were just talking about this property here on Redgate Lane. I, I've zoomed out because I'm going to switch to zoning maps so you can actually see where the zoning line is between the, the different zoning districts. Because I think it's pertinent when you look at this lot in relation to other lots within, within its zoning district. So this is located in the RG zoning district, a general residence, which is medium to high density. RN, which is just here to the north, is medium density. Um, 
for dimensional requirements in the RN, you're at 20,000 square feet for minimum lot area and 6,000 square feet for each additional unit that you want to have. Contrast that with the RG, which is 12,000 square feet for the first unit, and then 2,500 square feet for an additional unit if it's a duplex, so non owner occupied duplex like what we're proposing here. So you would need 14,500 square feet for uh, a duplex in the RG zoning district. You would need 26,000 square feet for a non owner occupied duplex in the RN zoning district. So while you just had a conversation about this zoning district, I do want to draw your attention to um, the RG zoning district. One of the other uh, differentiating pieces between the two districts, and I'll back up and say one more thing, this site right here has over 22,000 square feet. So it could fit three units under zoning um, and it would be allowed. There's no waivers. There's nothing else being would, that would be asked for. And apartments are one of the use types that's allowed in the RG. Apartments are not allowed in the RN. Also in the RG, as you likely know, non-owner occupied duplexes uh, don't transfer if there's a change of ownership. The, the permit expires and a new owner would have to come back. It's a condition in your use table in your zoning bylaw uh, that requires an, a new hearing process. So when you are granting this permit, assuming that you're going to grant it, and we hope you do, you're granting it to the owner and the person that's in front of you. You're not granting it to somebody who you don't know uh, yet. So this is the site. I'll zoom in just a little bit so you get an even better sense of where we are. Uh, North Whitney Street, you've got Town of Amherst land right here. You've got obviously Town of Amherst land off of Chestnut Street. And then you've got some other, um, you've got a, a multifamily, it's a three unit property right here. And then there's, we can talk about it later, several rentals um, in the area, non owner occupied uh, units in the area. So that's just a little bit of the site and, and context of the area. What I'll do now is I will bring up the map, or rather the plan. So now if you can see uh, my screen, what we've got is the site plan for the 180 North Whitney Street project. Um, you've got North Whitney Street at the bottom of the page, the existing two-story four-bedroom structure right here. Uh, and if you recall from the site visit, there is a, a driveway that comes in. That driveway is remaining and expanding. The um, addition is going to go on, the additional unit is going to go on the back of the property compliant with all side, rear, front yard setbacks. The proposal is for six parking spaces. Um, and some, even though it's only a, a non-owner occupied two family and does not have stormwater uh, requirements, they are providing um, a, a dry well and a stormwater area. As you'll also recall from the site visit, there are some um, dead pines in the back. There's a dead pine over here. Those are gonna be removed. Um, you'll also see from this plan that there's a relatively steep grade that goes off down um, to the neighboring properties, but it's all heavily vegetated there. Uh, so there'll be sufficient screening between the back of this property and any uh, abutting residential properties. Um, overall, a pretty simple, I mean, we'll talk about the design in a little bit, but overall a pretty simple site plan, really keeping what's there, adding on some uh, sufficient parking and then building towards the back of the site. Mr. Um, Reedy, very quick question. Sure, please. Um, so since you're talking about the parking spaces, does those parking spaces anticipate guest parking? They do not. Uh, there are, so we're anticipating what we're proposing is for eight bedrooms, uh, six parking spaces. We could expand to have additional parking spaces if the board thought that that was necessary. Uh, some of the thinking is that this driveway area provides sufficient area for guest parking and the lease provides that there's no long-term guests. So, you know, folks coming, 
com parking coming in, um, that would be acceptable because everybody there would be able to communicate well enough to say, okay, well, park behind me. And then, you know, I'm not leaving. Uh, why don't you leave? Uh, you know, when you leave, then I can leave sort of thing. But no, the six spaces contemplates resident parking. Thank you. You're welcome. What I'll do now, if there's other questions, because I'm going to move over to the architecture and the, the floor plans. If there's other questions on the site, I'm more than happy to, to discuss them. Uh, Mr. Chair, if you want to talk about the site visit, Oh, that was probably up. You know, uh, to do it. Mr. Reedy, thank you. I am. I. I, go, I was. I'm right. I should talk about the site visit. I have to go through the submissions, and which I didn't do. And I appreciate your reminder on that. Um, thank you very much. So um, we did have a site visit um, on Tuesday. Uh, again, it was Mr. Sloviter and Mr. Henry and I. Uh, and we I met uh, Mr. Barry, Mr. Reedy, and um, Miss Morrissey's father, I think, was also at the, at the uh, site visit. Uh, we uh, walked around the property and we looked at the uh, place where the parking lot was going to be, the proposed parking would be. We observed where the, the existing house um, sits. Um, we observed the uh, trees that have to be removed because of uh, at the end of the property and the, uh, the vegetation towards the very back of the property. We noted a house next door, which looked to be a house with um, um, multiple cars parked next to it, which appeared to be a rental housing. Um, we also observed the, there was a, a kind of a, a, a gentle curve to the property, the road out in front on North Whitney Street, turning into Red Gate Lane. Um, and we walked the property to make sure to assess the size of the addition, the proposed addition. And I think that was pretty much it. We talked about the goal briefly about what the, uh, the goals of the application are and what that the building is, but that was, that was about all we did at the property. I think Mr. Henry or Mr. Sloviter, is there anything that I missed? No, you, I, you did not, Mr. Chair. Good. No, I can, I concur. So I'm going to go through the submissions real quickly on this. this won't count against the time of Mr. Reedy or, or public comments. Um, we, we've received the following applications, the application form, a management plan, a complaint response form, project cover letter, ZBA, 18 plans. We received a cover sheet. Those plans include a cover sheet of floor plan and exterior elevation, exterior ex and other exterior elevations, and a uh, sheet by Robert Levesque, uh, architects, that's a SP, I think that's a um, site plan. Um, we also have a sample lease agreement. In addition, to, I think there are no staff submissions, although it, although there, I think there was one comment from somebody on the staff regarding a separation of the new building from the old building for fire for fire um, protection. But we received we did receive numerous um, public comments on this, and I'm going to run through it real briefly to make sure that uh, we identify each. We have a letter from, an email, excuse me, from Amy Sweeting on May 8th. We have an, one from Andrew Spiel, Spiel, I'm sorry, Spiel Vogel on May 9th. We have a letter from Benjamin Bailey on um, May 3rd, a letter from Charlene and Luke Bloomfield of May 8th. We have a letter from Diana Peel, May 9th, a letter from uh, Ellen Elena Davis on May 7th. We have a letter from Jessica Kane on the 9th. We have a letter from uh, Joya Mistra on the, the 9th. We have a letter from uh, Maxine Oland on the 7th. We have a letter from um, Maya Ross on the 10th. We have a letter from Ms. Nancy Schwartz on the 2nd. We have a letter from uh, another letter from Nancy Swartz on the 9th. We have a letter from uh, Neil Weschler on the 8th. We have a letter from Diana and Paul Peel on the 9th. We have a letter from Ms. Morrissey. I think that was received today, but a letter from Ms. Morrissey. We have a letter from um, Bruce Giffen on the, oh, I don't have a date on that, but that, 
covers a, a petition and signatories on a petition regarding this. There were 42 signatories on that petition. We have a left letter on the, from the 20th from um, I think it's it's Yoav Ellen Vensky. That's not I miss I just butchered that name. It's Ellen Ivesky. And we also have a letter from uh, the same person on the 17th. And we have a letter from Julia Reichmeyer on uh, Julia Reichmeyer on the, I don't that's undated on my copy here. We have a letter on the from the on the 23rd from Kurt and, Kurt Wise and Rachel Brody, and I think that's it in terms of letters. Did I miss any, Miss Brestrup or Miss Sadler? I think I, if I did, it's in, unintentional. But I think we covered most of them, and I and I have read them all. All right, Mr. Reedy. Excellent. And I'll let me take this opportunity. Pam, if you could let uh, Jim Morrissey in, um, Athena's dad, he's the property manager. So just in case there's some questions later on, Jim can answer them. Thanks. Um, so what I'll do now, I'll turn it over to Tom uh, Barry. You know, what I'll do is I'll first pull up these images. And then Tom, if you want to just walk through a little bit of the architecture, um, material selection, decisions, et cetera, that we can get into floor plans a little bit and then come back to management. Sure, sure. I'll keep this, try to keep this short. Um, architecturally, uh, our priorities uh, for this edition were to match the character of the neighborhood, um, have a minimal impact from the street, and to not upstage the existing farmhouse. Uh, and so we settled on the classic New England farmhouse, backhouse barn style uh, to accomplish that. Um, it's not only com common in New England, it's common in this neighborhood itself. Uh, and I think it's it's fairly clear uh, from these renderings uh, that we've, we've um, created this addition to be the barn component of the building. We've tucked it visually behind the existing farmhouse uh, that minimizes its presence from the street. Um, and then we've detailed the building with very simple vernacular uh, detailing as far as the trim, materials, fenestration. Uh, we've painted it red to, to further the connection. Um, let's see, we can move on to floor plan, Tom. Very simple floor plan. Uh, it is four bedrooms, uh, three below, excuse me, one on the first floor and three above on the second. Um, we have tried to make a compact floor plan uh, because that, again, lessens the scale and impact uh, on the site and on the street. Um, if you page down to the last two pages, Tom, I think this does, a, these uh, exterior elevations do a good job of just showing that the addition is is well in the scale of the existing building. Um, it doesn't overwhelm the existing farmhouse, which is important. Um, page down again. Uh, so this is looking from the other side and from the street looking at the farmhouse, uh, this barn will barely be visible. It will tuck. I think of it as a visual slipstream, just tucks right behind the existing farmhouse. Do you have so, that elevation? I'm sorry? Do you have it from the street elevation? We I do don't not. think straight on. I don't know that we have one straight on from the street. Yeah, we don't have straight on from the street. With, with, because I think you would, uh, if I may, Tom, I this is probably as close as you're getting because this is the east. And I think what they've done is taken away the front farmhouse because you wouldn't be able to see the addition. This is that, if you remember that connector piece, I'm going to move my mouse around this connector right here. That's what you're seeing right here. And so 
if you wanted, you know, and we can always provide it. Um, but I don't, I don't think you'd see the, the back if we were to provide the front, if you will. Go ahead, Mr. Gray. That was my only question. Uh, no, I'm glad you're asking questions. I'm, I intend to keep it short and sweet. This is a very simple building. So let's, I'm, I'm finished there. I'm happy to answer questions. Sure. So, Mr. Chair on architecture, if you've got any um, questions, floor plan, we can spend more time on that. What, whatever is the the pleasure of the board, or we can but talk. My about quick question is: How many bedrooms are in the existing building, and how many bedrooms are in the um, the proposed addition? Sure. So, there's four in each. Um, as Tom had noted, you know, I'll go to the maybe I'll go existing first. So, this is the existing here in the front. That's first floor existing in the front second floor you've got one bedroom here dining kitchen living porch and then upstairs you've got bedrooms three four uh two three and four sorry and then when you come back to this proposed again one bedroom on the first floor and bedrooms two three and four on the top floor and i believe that it's you know this this new piece is a four bedroom two bath and the uh, front piece, and Athena, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it's four bedroom, one bath. Thank you. Anything else about uh, architecture, floor plan, et cetera, from the board? Okay. No, um, move on. Okay. Uh, I'll stop to share and just talk a little bit about management. Uh, you know, I, I asked uh, Jim's here. Um, he lives in Amherst, about five minutes away. He's going to be responsible, really, for the day-to-day -day management of it. Mathena, um, you know, I know there were some letters from Abutters thinking it was some venture capital, financially backed, et cetera. This is Mathena, and her dad's helping her out, right? He's going to be the manager of this property. Um, like I said, Jim lives in Amherst. Mathena had grown up in Amherst. It's her hometown. You've got the management plan, weekly trash pickup, who to call in case there's an issue. Um, we've got um, the landscaping, who's in charge of the landscaping. We've got lease provisions in case there are unruly tenants. Uh, there's a pretty strong lease that allows eviction if, if there's anything untoward uh, at the property. And then, like I said, I think the biggest thing is having Jim, you know, five minutes away if if there is an issue. I think that's the, the the biggest piece of this is the board knows it's it's that type of management that you need. So um not only is he local, but it's also his daughter's property. And so he's probably going to be extra local at that point. Um again, pretty simple, not on occupied duplex in the general residence zoning district. We can we can answer any questions that you have, but I don't think we need to belabor our presentation anymore. Uh, Mr. Morrissey, just give your name and address for the for the record. Uh, Jim Morrissey, twenty three Blackberry Lane, Amherst. In the um, application, I think it was uh, you you were referenced and said that you have uh, managed properties before. Is that correct, or that you've done? That's correct. Things? Yes, currently, so, um, I work in construction management, and part of that involves property management of commercial and residential units. And residential property here in the in Amherst. Uh, residential property in Northampton. Northampton. Okay. Um, looks to me like this is. Uh, it seems obvious to me that this is um, a setup for eight students. I mean, that's kind of what we're looking at. I'm, I, I, is there any plans to market this to families, or is this going to be for? Uh, this is principally student residents, and that's not necessarily prejudicial, but I, it just seems to me to be you know, what is realistic and the, from the design of the property and the design of the addition, especially. What is the thoughts in rental? Yeah, and, and Jim or Mathena, I'll probably turn it over to you to, to ask you, but I, I, I'm going to first turn to Tom and ask him about the design and, and how materially this design would differ, you know, to me, when I when I see bed bath parity, I think students. You know, when I see four bed four bath or a bath connected to a bed, that's where I say, oh boy, you know, is this going to be students? This one, I think, 
is a little bit more versatile. I mean, I think we know the market in Amherst. If if it happens to be students, it could be students. Could it be a family like we heard in the last uh, Red Gate Lane hearing? I would think so. I mean, as I, as you also know, there's you know, not the ability to, not that you'd want to discriminate. Um, and so, you know, there are, well, students are not a protected class. They're, uh, it's still not something that we would ever suggest, you know, any client does. So Mathena or Jim, I don't know if you've got, you know, as far as marketing goes, if it's, you know, we'll see who comes in there. We just want somebody who's responsible uh, or if it's like a targeted group. So I'll, I'll leave the two of you to answer. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, this is my personal property and we've spent a lot of time on very nice plans. Like this is a very nice property. And so tenant selection is very important to me personally. Yeah, and, and I would add, um, you know, well-designed, well-built property attracts the, the best tenant. And that's our goal here is, is to get very good tenants, manage this professionally. We want this to be an asset to Amherst. Um, that's our goal at the end of the day. So you, in your um, presentation, Mr. Reedy, you talked about the willingness to perhaps expand the parking to uh, eight, be uh, on six. So you have eight units, arguably, it's, you only need to have four car, four parking spaces for that, but um, you, you probably have four, you probably have eight tenants with um, eight cars, it's likely. Um, are you willing, is there any flexibility on, on increasing parking spaces to decrease the amount of parking on the street? Yeah, Mathena, I think I'll I'll ask you here in front of everybody. I think that's probably okay, right? I don't I don't see an issue there. A hundred percent. Yeah, we're yeah. okay with adding two more. Yeah, we can we can certainly add a couple of parking spaces, Mr. Chair. Are there um, other? I don't want to dominate the questions from the board. So this is the, this is the time for board members if they have questions to to raise them. I guess I would also ask, what was the house before you bought it, Ms. Morrissey? Was it a rental house? Was it a single family house? How was, what, what and, and have you rented it out? Are you currently renting it out or are you fixing it up? Yep, so um, it was a single family historically, but it was in very, very rough condition, um, barely even livable. And so we did a cosmetic renovation um, and it's in really good shape now, and it's currently vacant. Okay. And that single family was, was it, was it owner occupied or was it rental? Do you know? It was owner occupied. Thank you. Questions from board members? If there are no questions from board members or no comments, I would uh, turn it over to time for public comment. Um, this is the time for the public to express their uh, views on this application. As I said earlier tonight, if you wish to speak, so indicate by raising the, by using the raised hand function on your phone or on, on, the, on the Zoom application. If you got a phone, do star nine so we can identify who you are. Uh, when you're called upon, please leave your name and address for the record. Uh, keep your comments to about three minutes. I'll try to assist with keeping a timer going and direct your comments to the board and not to uh, the applicant or to any individuals, but keep your comments to the board. So I see you here. Yes, Mr. May I ask one question before we go to public comments? Absolutely. Um, just for the homeowners, are you guys aware that there's a change.org petition against this property? Have you guys seen that? It, there's a what? A change.org petition to not grant this permit. No, I'm not aware of that. Seen it? So is that, yes, that, well, I, I mentioned it on the, on the, uh, in the submissions, but it was that's the petition that was signed by 42 people. I'm not, 
I don't know who organized the yeah. position. It was in one of the public comments, just for that, just as an FYI. Yeah. Have you have you seen that petition? Mr. Yeah, Mr. I did see a petition uh, before the May 9th hearing. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Miss uh, Miss Swartz. Okay. I assume, I assume you can hear me. Yes, um, we can hear you. Great. This is great. Yeah, I'm Nancy Schwartz. Uh, I own and live at 153 High Street. We are kind of diagonal abutters in the back. And and I I just want to speak to the difference between an owner-occupied two-family and a non-owner-occupied two-family. We are owners of a two-family. We've, we've been here for 32 years. It has worked out beautifully. We are very selective about who we rent to, and we've never had a, a single complaint about any noise issues or anything. When a property goes from owner-occupied to non-owner-occupied, I've witnessed firsthand what has happened in the property directly in back of me at one, uh, let's see, what is it? 174 North Whitney. It's a three family, three units. And it was owner occupied until 2018. And we never had any problems. It was, it was very nicely managed. Uh, Kevin Banks uh, owned it, lived in it uh, until he passed away. And then the family uh, sold it. And I will say that it then became a non-owner occupied three family. There was never any special permit hearing that changed the status from owner occupied to non-owner occupied, which kind of raises some red flags for me. But I will say that in the six years or since it's changed to that type of arrangement we have had nothing but noise and trouble and me having to call police at 2 a.m. for loud parties, et cetera. It's very hard to reach even a, a manager. I mean, I, we, in the middle of the night, I'm looking on the, the town, the rental permit uh, page, trying to get, you can't get a hold of a manager at 2 a.m. Uh, it, 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 it's just different, I will just say. This, this neighborhood that we picked was a nice mix of single family, multifamily, and for the most part, owner occupied multifamily. Um, and I will say that the, the block on North Whitney directly in back of us in the last six years has changed from being three owner occupied single family plus one three family house to now three rental properties. And I am not against two families. I think two family properties are fantastic to get people, get their foot in the door for home ownership. It's a wonderful way to help pay a mortgage and to, to build some equity. But a non-owner occupied uh, arrangement is, is a totally different scenario. So I'll, just, I'll just keep it at that. And I'm not against the, the two family being built, but I am against the fact that an owner will not be living in the property. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Swartz. Uh, Mr. Wise is the next person up. Is this my hand raised? Mm -hmm. No, it's not suggested. Uh, no, I see Amy is the next one. Amy, can you identify yourself and give your address? Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, I, I'm sorry. I'm Amy Sweeting. I live at 179 right across the street. I'm sorry. I'm at my son's graduation dinner. So I'm running outside of the restaurant. Give me a sec. Um, okay. Thank you very much to the board. I appreciate you giving us a chance to talk. Can you still hear me? You sure can. Love okay. I'm outside now. All right. 
where Benjamin and I wrote that together. I think we had about 57 people who signed it. So I just want to, a lot of my concerns are in there. So I don't want to repeat all of that because you've already seen that. Um, I just want to say that just echoing the public safety and the noise concerns, and just as um, Nancy was saying, we already feel the effects of um, the 174 North Whitney Street. We live right across the street. It's not owner occupied. There's frequently cars parked in front of and across the street from the house. Last year, there was a tenant with a very loud motorbike that he revved at all hours of the night and day. There's often shouting and arguments. And we just know that if there's eight bedrooms at 180, that will mean at least eight more cars. And as we've seen on Taylor and at the top of Redgate and on Strong Street, there's generally a lot more cars than bedrooms parked at these houses. And there's a real public safety concern at the, in that where this house is located with all of that traffic. Um, mm -hmm. Another real concern we have is about the character of the neighborhood. We also moved here in 2007, chose it as a family neighborhood. You could walk to school from elementary through high school. And a big plus for us was that the neighborhood was on the other side of East Pleasant Street, the non-UMass side of Central Amherst. But each year we feel like the university encroaches more and more. And I was particularly struck by a story that was making the rounds on our neighborhood listserv uh, about the November 2023 ZBA meeting, where you guys heard a, a petition from a Lincoln Avenue resident who was applying for a permit to convert her property to a non-owner occupied duplex. And she noted that, that although she had planned to age in place in that house, which had been in her family for three generations, they were now the last owner occupied house on a street full of student rentals with the accompanying traffic and noise. And in approving her application, one of your board members, I'm not, I can't remember who, noted that her block was clearly past the tipping point and he admired her for holding out for so long. And as I read that, I just thought, I was hoping that hopefully that won't be us one day trying to convert our house if the conversion of houses on our street continues unchecked. I don't want to find have no option but to convert if we go past the tipping point. And finally, I will just say that even if this special permit application does go through, I imagine the owners can still rent to four students rather than eight. And I'm not opposed to students. What we're opposed to is the size of this potential construction. But and also if it if it remains a single family house and it becomes a student rental, one day it could maybe go back to a single family house if the university provides more housing or we develop a townwide plan to alleviate the pressure <laughs> on our family neighborhoods. It can go back to being a family home. But if this permit goes through and this construction goes through, there will be no going back on this property because it will be a very large you know, property with a parking lot and it could never go back to being a single family house. So um, I would just say that. And I would just also you know, encourage you to read the petition if you haven't already, because that we worked on that with a, a large group of neighbors participated in that and everybody gave their comments and we collated them into that petition to kind of represent the neighborhood. Thank you very much. That Thank is it. Thank you very much. Uh, the next comment I see is from an Andrew Spielvogel. Mr. Spielvogel, you're still muted. There we go. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm in the street on um, 33 Redgate. And my wife and I, we, we chose the neighborhood because it's a quiet, very family neighborhood that has been discussed previously. And in the previous uh, proposal, there was a comment made by one of the board members uh, making a reasonable assumption about like if there's a flag lot building on it and i feel like when you may when we bought our home in this family or in a single family neighborhood excuse me may i interrupt for a minute yep. yeah. that, Mr. Steele, though, the, hold on for a second the audio is really hard to understand i don't think anyone can understand what you're saying can you either get closer to your phone or somehow change the way you're doing this audio because it's really can hard. You, Everybody wants to hear what you have to is say. This better? Is this better? That's better. That's better. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I, I, uh, I understand all of my wife. Um, oh, now you're, you're breaking now up you're again. Now you're worse again. Yeah. 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 Mr. Mr. Spielvogel, you're breaking up again. Did you just kind of turn or did you walk out? Did you walk around the room someplace? I, I haven't moved. I'm on the internet though, so maybe that's why. 
Well, um, right now you're good. It's right now, whatever you're now. doing right this instant is fine. I'll move. Uh, I, in the previous uh, um, special permit uh, earlier today, there was, made, there was a comment made by the um, zoning board by one of them saying that there was a reasonable assumption that that flag lot be built. And, and I guess my point is that we bought into this neighborhood. It's a single family, like um, single family, very family oriented, quiet neighborhood. And we also made a I feel like a reasonable assumption that this neighborhood would, since it's zoned as single family homes, would continue to be, um, continue in that character. And I know that many things have been said about um, the safety concerns, but even if there are eight parking spots, there's always going to be way more cars than that. Or we just we just lost Mr. Spielvogel. Um, he can come back at a later point. Um, next is Bruce and Dorothy Griffin. Hi, uh, I'm Bruce Griffin. Uh, we live at 44 Redgate Lane. Um, <clears throat> I walk to town. Uh, past this house uh, and have done for the last 31 years. <clears throat> this There's a lot of pedestrian traffic, a lot of uh, bicycle traffic, uh, baby carriages, you name it. Uh, this is a very popular uh, walking route, pedestrian route through this neighborhood. Um, and this particular property is right at the intersection between Redgate Lane, North Whitney Street, and uh, a historic pathway, uh, Skillings Path, um, which is heavily used by students to the middle school and high school and uh, the residents of the neighborhood. Uh, and all of this uh, comes intersects at uh, the point right next to uh, 180 North Whitney Street. Um, so people are leaving the, the pedestrian path and walking out into the roadway. Uh, people walking up North Whitney Street, if they are walking on the sidewalk, are forced out onto the street because the sidewalk ends at the driveway for 180. Um, there, uh, another factor to consider is that traffic tends to speed up on Redgate Lane because people use it as a shortcut and there's a long straightaway before it suddenly sure. goes downhill and then turns uh, right just immediately before 180. Um, if there were cars parked in the street habitually there, which I am absolutely sure we would see with eight bedrooms in this building, um, the, it would be a very dangerous situation. Um, and I put that in a letter and I hope you will consider that public safety is an issue in this precise location. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Riffin. The next person on line is Mr. Kurt Weiss. Mr. Weiss, you're still muted. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, it takes a while for that unmute button to pop up. So there may be yeah. a line for other people as well. And I'll just note also that um, uh, that I have I'm Kevin Gallagher here. here still as he's still kicked out of the meeting. Um, so he may wish to, if you are receiving his comments, he may wish to do so after I've spoken. My name is Kurt Wise. I live with my partner and daughter at uh, 31 Maplewood Drive, right around the corner um, down the street. We also own uh, a rental house at 63 Redgate Lane. Um, I guess my comments, I want to focus on the idea of family housing. 
we've owned um, that we've rented uh, 63 Redgate Lane for 10 years uh, to three different families and only to families. Um, as someone else was saying about their rental um, with other families, you know, that's worked really well. There've never been any complaints. It's gone very smoothly. I think that, um, you know, I, uh, this house is clearly designed uh, to for student housing. Uh, and there's a, you know, a need for student housing, um, but that's also the function of zoning. Um, that to keep sort of disparate activities separate from each other. And, uh, you know, student housing is kind of a different uh, beast than family housing. Uh, our house um, had a major plumbing leak, was totally destroyed. Uh, several years ago, we had to move out uh, for a year. We moved around the corner to Taylor Street, corner of Taylor and High Street. That's a, play, a neighborhood that's been taken over by student housing. We, you know, enjoyed regular parties Thursday through Sunday, had the police there regularly, were woken up uh, late at night with people um, very drunk, pounding on our door, insisting that they're, that they lived at our house. Um, you know, the streets are incredibly crowded with cars. You can't really get two cars through. So there's, you know, there's a role for student housing. I was a student once. I lived in student housing and I wouldn't want to live next to myself uh, when I was, uh, you know, 20 and, uh and a student. So I think that, you know, there's a real concern about that. I think that having the requirement that it be a f an owner occupied house is uh, goes a long way towards um, trying to control some of the worst aspects of that. And, you know, many students are great and most students are probably great 90% of the time. And, you know, it's that other portion of the time that's a real challenge. Um, and this neighborhood, North Whitney, Redgate is still kind of is holding its own but you know, barely against this tide of investor um, conversion to student housing. And I think it's the role of the zoning board to maintain family housing. If there is a way to uh, guarantee that this will be uh, to require enforceably that this is family housing, wonderful. Rental family housing is an important element of our community and they're great neighbors. I mean, we have great families. They're our neighbors with kids in the neighborhood that go to our schools. That is a very different kettle of fish than eight students, which we've watched, you know, at the intersection of Redgate and Strong Street, you know, that is that flipped, you know, a year ago, two years ago, and it's completely different now with parking and you name it. Um, so I would strongly encourage uh, the board not to uh, uh, accept this application um, for all those reasons. Um, I'll I'll stop there, and uh, if the board is interested in hearing from uh, Mr. Gallagher at this time, I'll turn it over to him. Yes, I regret, Mr. Gallagher, that you are uh, you're on the line for whatever reason. So uh, go ahead and speak for three okay. minutes. Um, Kevin Gallagher, uh, 68 Maplewood Drive. Um, I'm just going to comment very briefly on the safety issue. So um, a number of times we have called the police about the parking situation at the um, corner of Redgate and Strong Street, and the police say there's nothing they can do. Um, cars, you know, eight, 10 cars will be parked right up to the corner on both sides of the street, making it extremely hazardous for cars, either pulling out onto Strong Street or cars from Strong Street pulling onto Redgate. Um, I know that's not the purview of this particular board, but I think, I mean, the, the enforcement of parking regulations is not your purview. Um, but the fact that, um, this is a situation um, at on Whitney that may contribute to you know, safety issues and the deterioration of um, safety and, and parking along a particular neighborhood, I think should be something that you take into account. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. That's, that's um, next, we have a Mr. Mike Bowen. Hi, uh, Mike Bowen um, from 38 Pioneer Street, Westfield. Um, I'm actually part of the team from Arlo X Associates um, who worked on the site plan. Um, so if you just wanted to add me to the meeting, um, I've been here the whole time, uh, but if there are any questions uh, regarding uh, like site uh, utilities or stormwater, I could be available to answer any of those. Yeah, we didn't, uh, Ms. Ms. Sadler, would you uh, add into the... Mm -hmm in case we need to talk to him. Thank you, Mr. Bowen. Yep. Uh, 
Mr. Munger is the next person up, Freddie Munger. There, thank you. It's not Mr. Munger. Oh, it, it is. I, you know, as soon as I said, <laughs> as soon as I said that, I knew I you should. You know, my mother. It's I my mother's it. fault, not your fault. Let me put it that way. Well, it's it's. I apologize. I sincerely apologize. I knew I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, no reason to apologize. Okay, I'm Freddie Munger. I live at 187 North Whitney Street, uh, right across the street from the driveway of 180. And there are three driveways that converge at that point. Mine, the Sweetings, and the one across the street. Up the street a little bit is another driveway for Mary Anderson's property. We've lived here since 1976, so I get the award, I think, for the longest surviving neighborhood person. Neighborhoods change over time. My neighborhood has changed uh, from a largely working class neighborhood uh, inhabited by custodians and uh, nurses and uh, uh, people who worked in the greenhouses and retail people and secretaries to a basically middle class neighborhood with professionals moved in. Um, my concerns are about my safety my property safety and the children's safety. Um, we already have one car that's parked on the street between across the street from me between Skillings Path and the driveway to 180 every night overnight for the last three years. Uh, there's uh, two years ago there was a car parked right in front of my house for several months. I thought it was abandoned, so I called the police. They said no, it belonged to somebody who was on campus, but she was too busy to move it, but she'd move it at the end of the semester. My concern is if the volume of parking on North Whitney Street represents the volume of parking on South Whitney Street, which is a whole different culture um, of 18 to 23 year olds down there, uh, that emergency vehicles will not be able to get down my driveway, not fire and not ambulance. And being elderly with a with a husband who's also elderly and not well, we've had to have the ambulance over a few times and it would not be able to make the turn if there were two cars parked on either, you know, on, on my side of the street and one on the other side of the street. So that's my personal safety. Um, in terms of property, our mailbox has been knocked over at least four times by cars. And I can't keep a number up on the street because that's the snow plows knock it down every year. So um, it's, the, the risks of those sorts of things happening go up when the when the density of population, the balance of population between eighteen between populations of eighteen to twenty three year olds and populations of middle aged and older people become unbalanced. You know, it becomes more difficult for um, to have the same kind of to agree on a code of conduct. Code of conduct for 18 to 23 year olds is appropriate for their age group, but quite different than an unspoken code of conduct for people who own houses in my neighborhood. In terms of courtesy, I'm tired of being sworn at and having people flip me the bird as I walk by their houses at Taylor Street. Um, it's kind of rude. So that has been my experience. But in terms of neighborhoods changing, of course they change. Um, and uh, it would be nice if we could keep a balance between people who are renting for short periods of time say six months a year two years who have a who don't have a commitment to the community to the community of proximity the neighborhood or the town and people who have a longer who are either renting or owning who have a longer sense of engagement with neighbors with the neighborhood and with with the town if we can keep that at a certain balance, of course, it's wonderful to have young people in the neighborhood. Some of the 18 to 23 year olds who rent are very kind. They make offers to help. They don't actually fulfill them, but they make at least they make offers. Others, it's difficult to, to be neighbors with. So it's not, it's the age group. It's not the fact that they're students. And, and it's Ms. also- Munger, can you kind of wrap it up here? Just give I'm us done, bye. <laughs> Right. I don't want to cut you off. Just your final sentence is, is all we That's need. That's okay. I'm done. All right. Thank you, Ms. Munger. And again, apologize for um, misgendering you. I'm sorry. Mr. Trobaugh, uh, Ted Trobaugh. I'll... Is it on yet? Yep. You're on. Please give us your oh. name and address. 
My name is Ted Trobaugh. I live at 134 Maplewood Circle. And I just want to second virtually all of the comments that have been made about uh, parking, about speed. I on more than once have interacted with students who were going 40 miles an hour down that road uh, while my wife and I are walking with two dogs. There are no sidewalks uh, between 180 and uh, Strong Street. Um, and uh, also, I just want to um, restate, approve, can't think of the word I want, those who are in support of an owner-occupied duplex. That is a very different, a very different um, entity. So I am opposed to the non-owner-occupied duplex. Um, and I, I could be fine with an owner-occupied duplex. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trobel. Um, we've got, it's about 8.55. I see two more hands up for public comment. My intention would be to take these next to Yoab and Elena Davis. I uh, have those um, people speak. Anybody else that wishes to speak, please indicate and we will put you on the list for the time when we continue this hearing and make sure that you get a chance to speak then. But um, if so, for those of you that wish to speak, I see, I see Mary Ann with the, Chris, will you take note that Mary Anderson, Andrew Spielvogel, and if there's anybody else who wishes to speak that won't get a chance to tonight, we'll make sure we get them on the, the, the next time we have a hearing on this subject. Um, so next is for Yo, Yoav. Please give us your name and address for the record. Yes, my name is Yoa Velinevsky. I live on 11 Red Gate Lane. And I would like to, I agree with the, everything that people said before me, but I would like to suggest to you a different way to look at it. I invested probably close to more than $200,000 in the, in the city of Amherst. If I add my neighbors that lived here for 30 years, all together, we contributed in property tax $1 million to the city of Amherst. And we expect the city of Amherst to protect our neighborhood. Now, let's not uh, play games here. Given the growing need for student housing and where we are, it is reasonable to assume that this will end up as a student housing. Listen, eight students. Now, to me, it looks like a dorm, it smells like a dorm, and it sounds like a dorm. And I want to ask you, what is this dorm going to do to the quality of our neighborhood, to the quality of our life, after living here for more than 30 years and now taking our grandchildren for walks with, 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 the, with now 10 more cars next to us? So please. Be, consider us rather than in th those who are here for investment in, in, in student housing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, last, uh, Elena Davis. And also please note that there's a Nick that has indicated he wishes to speak as well and he won't be able to get a chance to do that tonight. So Ms. Uh, Elena Davis, please give us your name and address. Can you hear me? Now we can. Oh, yep. sorry. It took me a minute to figure that out. <laughs> it's like calling into a radio show. You know, there's always <laughs> there's that seven second delay. That's right. Yep. Thank you. Well, I appreciate being you squeezing me in. Um, you know, I, I agree with all of the comments that have been made. Oh, just give us your address. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, Elena Davis, uh, 20 Clifton Ave. Um, so I think given all the comments, I understand that neighborhoods change. My section of the street has changed significantly in the last couple of years since I bought my house. Um, you know, I understand that students need a place to live. 
I think it's really, you know, the plans look beautiful. It sounds like a lovely way to use the property. Um, you know, I think all of that, I, I understand. I think it's just, unfortunately, this particular spot where it's located, um, I really, you know, share in the safety concerns. Um, and I do think the reality adding the parking spots, you know, to have eight will be helpful. But I think, you know, the reality is that people have friends over, they have parents come visit, they have parties. Um, and that spot, the way the road curves, the fact that there's no sidewalk, you know, when you get north of that spot, um, the fact that it's used by, you know, not only myself and my children, but a whole neighborhood of, um, at, you know, elementary to high school age kids and homeowners going for walks. There, you know, lots of times I've had to jump on the curve because a car's coming fast around that corner heading south. Um, so it's not just having cars parked along there to make it more congested, but just having more cars of, you know, younger drivers who have a different sensibility about, you know, what speed they use going through a neighborhood. Um, I really, you know, I, I'm, I'm willing to keep myself safe and have to be more vigilant, but I don't think it's a fair ask for all of the other, um, you know, older folks and the kids who use that street a lot to walk places. So, you know, if there's a proposal to add a sidewalk um, along Redgate to that side of the street, I think that might be a slightly different scenario and that would be helpful, but I haven't heard any discussion of that. Um, so I think the reality is it's going to be more congested. They're going to be more fast drivers. And unfortunately at this particular spot on the road, it's just going to be a, a safety problem. Um, so I'll leave it at that. And I appreciate the chance to speak. Thank you, Ms. Davis. As I said, there's more people that wish to speak, but we're coming up we passed nine o'clock, so we kind of hit our, uh, our hard stop, but I want to give, uh, do two things. I want to give the um, applicant a chance to respond if they wish to tonight to some of the comments made. Uh, also know that you'll be able, when, as we will not reach a decision tonight on this, um, you'll be given a chance to respond to those again if you wish to um, think about it and respond at a later point in time, but to the extent you want to respond tonight, feel free to do so. And then after we uh, hopefully continue this to a later point, we've got a couple other things, a, a few other things we have to do before we can adjourn. So um, Mr. Reedy or Ms. Morrissey, whoever wishes to determine whether you want to respond to the public comments, please do so. Sure. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I don't think we need to <laughs> respond tonight. We've, we've read the letters, we've heard the comments. Uh, we know we're getting continued, which was expected. I guess my only question would be to the board and if there's any board comment, you know, if we're, we're going to be back in, you know, I'm assuming July 11th, um, what can we do between now and then what plan revisions, et cetera, what are the comments from the board just so we can come back and have a pretty comprehensive discussion. Okay. Well, that's the next order of businesses. What uh, any board questions or any board comments? So Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Um, <clears throat> So the common theme with everyone has been about safety. I I, I, I hear everyone's concerns about um, the concern of not only occupied, but you know I, I think on my notepad there were at least ten people who spoke, and the common theme is safety. And what was very telling was they said for the most part, that there was either no sidewalk or the sidewalk end. And I am not sure how this is the responsibility of the applicant here. And it would be interesting to see what if any request has been made of the town to rectify that issue. Because again, everyone says they have kids that walk in the neighborhood, they have to jump on the curb or car speed through there. It's regardless if we approve this permit or not, that issue is not going to go away. So I don't think that should fall on the applicants. So again, it'd be very interesting to see what, if anything, has the town received any complaints about safety in that neighborhood? 
what have they any consideration about a sidewalk, additional speed bumps, stop signs, things like that. So that is that that's what well, that was my one of my biggest takeaways was the safety concern. And I don't think the safety concern should fall on the applicants. Thank you. Other comments, other considerations um, for the applicant from board members? I'll just have to re reiterate, I walk there all the time. I walk there with my former running partners. We're not walking partners. And, and I would suggest that the safety is a big issue there. There, it's a walking street. There are people walking up and down there all the time. There are children who come up through Skilling's path and walk through, down that street. And that, that's a very difficult place to put eight bedrooms for students in that location. I, I, I just, I could not see how that could be functional and safety conscious for that neighborhood. It's just not the right location. Any other comments? So what I would like to do um, is move, entertain a motion to uh, continue this to a date certain and um, Chris, let's go through the dates with which we would be able to do that. It may be the same date as a Redgate hearing, but um, let's try to run through the possibility, possible dates and make sure that the applicant can attend as well. Um, I, I'm afraid I don't remember why we decided <laughs> against um, some of the previous dates. I think some of it was because the applicant and his yeah. uh, designer couldn't be there. But um, the dates when you have upcoming meetings are June 27th, um, which is when we had talked about continuing the um, 395 West Street. Yeah. And then you have July 11th. And your next date would be July 25th. Um, you also talked about an interim date of July 20th, but I or excuse me, June 20th, but I wasn't sure uh, why that date came up. Um, anyway, those are kind of the options. June 20th, June yep. 27th, July 11th, July 25th. <clears throat> so first, uh, first off, June 20th, is that a possibility for board members? And then we'll go to the applicant. That no, that's right. Okay, so it doesn't work for Craig. All right, and it doesn't work for Mr. Henry, right? For everyone. Right, right. yes. So let's go to June 27th. Does that work for everybody? That does. And I think that's when, all right, so let's choose June 27th. If, let's talk about, ask the applicant, does that date work for you? It works for me. Okay. I'm and, away, but uh, hopefully my wife will let me zoom in. <laughs> <laughs> We're all familiar with being away. <laughs> it, <laughs> nice places for getting on ZBA calls on Thursday night. Yep. Okay. We'll move to June 27th. So um, I would entertain a motion that we continue this public hearing until June 27th at six o'clock. Before we do, Mr. Chair, yeah. um, to Mr. Reedy's earlier question um, about what the board can see when we continue the hearing. So we cannot ignore the safety concerns um, of the neighborhood and the community. And while I do not believe it is on the applicant to solve this issue, it would be good to see something that you guys brought to the town about the safety concerns about this neighborhood vis-a-vis um, -vis the sidewalk and maybe speed bumps, stop signs, whatever, um, just to address the concerns of the neighborhood to see. Again, common theme here was safety that should not be ignored. So between now and then, it'd be, it'd be good to see you had some conversations with the town about what can be done to address some of those safety concerns. Okay. All right. 
If there's no other comments, oh, Mr. Sloviter, I saw your hand. No, that that was going to be so moved. The okay. last thing you said was looking for a motion. <laughs> Yep, I'm looking so, for a motion. So moved, I wanted to beat the others this time. Second. All right. We got we got a, a motion <laughs> and we have a second. Second. All right. We, it's moved and seconded to continue this until the, the public hearing until the 27th. Um, and if there's no further discussion, the chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Slobiter? Aye. Mr. White. Aye. All right. Vote is five to zero. Uh, we'll see you guys in a month. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next order of business is public comment on any matter not before the board tonight. Oops, what, what are we? What about continuing the public hearing for Mr. Laverdier's project at 395 oh, West you're, Street? You're so good, Chris, and I don't have my, my script in front of me. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, the next order of business is FY 2024-20, Ron Laverdier, that's requesting a special permit under section 3.3251 and 3.231 of the zoning bylaw to construct a 5,712 square foot mixed use building with nine residential units and two first floor commercial spaces and to construct a ways raised for walkway in the FPC zoning district with requested waiver from traffic impact study at 39 West Street map 19B parcel 1RB C Village Center Residents and Flood Prone, Prone Conservancy Zoning Districts. Um, he's written and asked us to, to uh, move this, to continue this as they um, have to, they have to have a fill, they need some filling um, um, variances or they need a filling uh, special permit. So um, he needs some time. Uh, Chris, what, when was the time that he could do this? He can make it on the 27th, June 27th. Okay. Uh, Let's try it for June 27th. Yep. Do I have a motion to continue? So the moved. FY 2020? So moved. Second? Second. All right. <laughs> moved and seconded. I don't think there's any discussion. All of us, uh, I vote aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. White? Oh, aye. what about time? Did you decide on it? Uh, we didn't decide on time. We got, but for the meeting, it's six o'clock. So the meeting is six o'clock. So this will come after. The other yeah. one was moved to six. Yeah. Okay, good. Sorry. Okay. Yep, that's okay. Um, chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows votes aye. Mr. White votes aye. Mr. Everald, you were voting. Aye. And Mr. Sloviter. Aye. All right. We had five to nothing. It's so, so ordered. Now, public comment on any matter not before the board tonight. That means you can talk about anything you wish, except those things we had on, the, on our agenda. Is there anybody who wishes to speak? Um, I see Nick's hands up. Nick, do you wish to speak on something not before, on a topic not before the board tonight? Or did Nick just leave his hand up? No response, Pam? I'm getting no response. Okay. I, I think it's just a, a, a residual. A zombie hand up there on, the, on Zoom. A Zoom zombie hand. That's it. We just created a new term. Okay, the next order of business is general is um, business not anticipated before the last 48 hours. And what the one thing I want to do is is um, just run through the schedule that we have, Chris, I know, if you can. And also, um, one of the things we need to do is have an administrative meeting uh, for the year where we elect officers, we, we have several new members, we have new associate members. And we it's, it's helpful to have a meeting with them to introduce them and kind of uh, bring them into the, um, the ZBA so they can ask questions and we can kind of provide an orientation for them. And I'd like to try to schedule that at some point. So, um, Chris, what do we have coming up? I know we have a solar hearing soon. We have a solar hearing on June 6th. Then we talked about not having a meeting on June 13th, although now that you can make it on June 13th, you might, maybe you want to have your um, administrative meeting administrative then. meeting on June 13th. Yep, we could try that. We'll, let's see what, if, what we should do. Let's, um, we, you know what I think we should do is tentatively schedule a June 13th administrative meeting. Let's not wait for a pub, another public hearing to have to schedule it. 
if we get a lot of people who can attend, if we get a majority, especially the new members, um, that'd be helpful. But we need a majority of the, perm the full members if we're going to take any action at the administrative meeting. So I can do the 13th. Mr. Sloboder, can you? Yes, I can. Mr. Henry, can you? I can, Mr. Chair. Mr. White, can you? I can. And Mr. Meadows, can you? I can call in from Colombia if need be. All right. Well, we've got four of the five. That's good. And then we we'd love to have you call in from Colombia. <laughs> um, we wouldn't want to leave you out. And then Chris, can you see if we get the um, if we can get some of the new newly appointed um, alternates to yes. also be to attend? And by that time, they should all uh, have filled their forms out and um, um, done the conflict of interest and every all the other things they have to do to become full mem become right. members of the ZBA. Okay, good. Let's schedule that. Um, that's all I have. Is there any questions that members of the board have? All right. Well, I appreciate our you guys going over time with us, but we got it done by nine fifteen, and that's uh, that's a good thing. All right. We'll see you all on the. Uh, I think the next time is the six, is the. Don't we need to vote to adjourn? We do. I'm just wrapping up. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. That's sorry. all right. <laughs> I've been sloppy tonight. Mr. White, do we have a motion to adjourn? <laughs> we do. <laughs> all right. And Mr. Slover, do you want to second that? I would like nothing more. You're, you are already on your chair, so I knew you were ready to go. All right. The, we have, it's moved and seconded to adjourn tonight. Um, there's, it's a non-debatable motion. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Sloboder? Aye. Thank you all. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Have a great night. Have a great night. Bye. Thanks, Pam. Thank you, Pam. You're welcome. Oh, you're welcome. We'll Thank see y'all soon. Have a good night. Stop the recording.